Welcome, everybody, to the 53rd episode of the Metaverse Nomads. There's so much to cover this week. Jesse is taking some well-deserved time off, but we do have some special guests for you. In a moment, we will go to the Metaverse news from the last week, and later on, we'll talk about the Star Atlas flight sneak peek video. Also, the debate of the century. What do you guys think of that? Spicy. It was, yeah, entertaining, yeah, spicy. emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, thanks for joining everyone this week. We've got three special guests. Uh, shout out Winston, uh, our squad leader from Rome, and of course, Tilquin and Dark Sweep from Meta from MMA. Yeah, thanks for having All us, right. guys. Always appreciated. Yeah. Glad to be back on the show. Yeah, pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming on. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I want to ask Winston, you know, when did you first join Rome? And, uh, all right, but well, we can get into it. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, go into some metaverse news first. But uh, yeah, it'd be great to get to know you a bit later. Yeah. So uh, yeah, how are you all doing today? I'm doing all right, man. It's just it's great. Been a, it's been a long week. Am I coming in with a leg? Uh, you seem all right to me. Okay, but yeah, I'm glad to be here. Another episode. Let's do it, guys. Yeah, so uh, going on to metaverse news, there is some. Um, uh, opinions about the current metaverse industry that is voiced by the founder of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin. He says uh, he doesn't think any of the existing ones are going to make it. So, what do you guys think about that? I think he's uh, well, trying to run the whole space. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, jokingly, but. I... <laughs> yeah, like. The thing is, I think uh, many uh, metaverse projects, they are like uh, selling you this idea that you're going to have this uh, what virtual space where we all interact. But that's been around for a while now, right? If you've played video games before. So I cannot get what it's uh, saying. Like, uh, like, for example, like, I guess, meta with Facebook. Like, what, what, uh, what is the new thing that they are proposing that wasn't there before? You know what I mean? Like, uh, I guess that's what he's trying to get at, maybe. Uh, I don't know so what you guys think about. If, yeah, if you look at the, the whole metaverse experience or, or stuff we've been going through from, like, the very first iteration of the metaverse, it's been going on for ages and ages and ages. And um, I'll give a little shout out to one of the guys I've been following for quite some time who has recently released a book uh, which is Matthew Ball uh, with his metaverse book just go look it up it's been ranking like obscene high in um, the world of, of books anyhow so um, go have a read on that because this guy has been doing research and study on the whole metaverse subject for over 20 years or something like that so it's really intense and really insane and he believes that uh, the whole metaverse thing that like it's coming together right now is a very good start of the whole thing uh, because we see a lot of building going through our, uh, towards the whole metaverse space in itself and a lot of big companies being involved in uh, or at least interested in building what we should perceive as the new metaverse so ultimately the momentum is good the momentum is great uh, in fact, but are we arriving at one metaverse? And that's, I think, the real question. Are we like not building a huge amount of little metaverses right now, which we all dream of having those uh, being interoperable with each other? Or should we aim to create a Web3 space, which is one metaverse where everyone is building and contributing to this whole goal of building one new space for everyone? I, I see a lot of projects building as their own entity and not maybe in, the, in, in this short amount of time thinking interoperability because of the amount of work and time it would take to make all metaverses across all genres of game in some way have a weapon or a vehicle or a plane or, or something or skin transfer over in that way. So that's pretty far out, maybe sooner than uh, it might become a reality sooner than later. But as far as the money and the the individuals who have that money, like this Dean down below is, is making a point to VCs are currently funding projects who, not, who are not gamers themselves. And I don't have a tab on every VC out there and, and who they are and their portfolio, but I can imagine the people who are interested in making money 
are coming in not necessarily caring about the particular video game or the studio that are building these games, but expect a return at some point. So uh, for the most part, the engagement of, with the VCs and money, uh, with the actual developers and builders, there's a disconnect there, potentially. And that could, that could leave a crack in the, in the floor where a lot of, of what we think and what we wish to become real with this uh, future interoperable one metaverse uh, might not happen because we're going to have to take two steps back um, and then move forward in a different direction. There, there probably will be a fork in the road at some point, like Tilkin was saying, uh, because of uh, so much innovation that took place in such a small amount of time. There's just so much out there. And uh, uh, yeah, but I look forward to it. Yeah, it could think, also um, be... Yeah, go on, Brad. Go on. Yeah. One of the interesting things about picking up on the word corporate there is that, yeah, ultimately they might not be the final destination, right? But these money exercises, when all these new things we're seeing, they're all learning curves, and we're starting to finally see what does or doesn't work, right? They might not be the final point, but they are helping us figure out, you know, the journey and the destination. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a it's a bad thing. I don't think it's a problem if, <laughs> if these guys are going to take us to where we want to be. I don't think it's a problem if it's not one of those things that becomes the metaverse if you know what i mean yeah exactly also yeah believe that potentially it could be linked process, or, yeah. uh, um, could be linked potentially through the eyes of being the founder of ethereum and being half of the metaverse on different change uh, chains being built and not everything on ethereum perhaps something is like in line with that as well so I think there's a lot of stuff to be figured out, but we're well on the way on getting at least some very good foot uh, in between the door. Yeah, so and uh, which direction we need to go and making it and making it easy for everyone to use is uh, two different things. It's going to take a lot of education, yes. which uh, relates yeah. to this next story about a Solana store in NYC. Yeah, it does look uh, interesting. It's very white and uh, it's got some cool features. Uh, it's kind of, I imagine it like an Apple store, but just for blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it has a phantom seed phrase booth and you can get a free NFT. Maybe it's not free, it doesn't say free, I'm not sure. But yeah, and this there's this interactive wall where it displays like a visual representation of what's happening on the Solana blockchain. So yeah, I think that's awesome. I'd love to have a wall of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah you it's... don't see any other chain uh, doing stuff like this no like uh maybe ethereum sometimes but like uh solana has a lot of uh, very uh i guess public uh, real life marketing you know what i mean like you, you see them out there doing stuff yeah. same thing with uh ftx right with uh Tilquin, what you showed us uh last time yes this weekend mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah, Solana, we all know that Solana uh, is, um, or at least FTX, uh, Sam, SBF, as he's been called by the community in, as a whole, um, that Sam is, is very well connected with Solana in general. So that could also fuel um, the whole development space of Solana. So. I wouldn't be surprised if it's really well linked to both parties there, Solana and FTX, and then the whole uh, going out and building these stores and making sure that people see Solana as a Web3 blockchain thing very first, because ultimately, in some way or another, they will arrive on FTX and trade on FTX in some sort of way, because Solana is literally built in in the FTX exchange. So yeah and uh, another cool thing is if you use solana pay it gives you 50 percent off they have a wall full of uh, nfts like printed out like paintings and you can buy them that way they partnered with uh, one of their pfp projects so that's interesting all very interesting i'm yeah, not sure if we have come to uh, new york from london for it but yeah <laughs> I'm a big fan of the aesthetic and the kind of look they're pulling off. I think that, you know, like mass adoption and stuff and people being able to go in person and experience it, it comes across as quite professional, actually, you know, it really does seem interesting. It's got, I think if we were to 
speculate the idea of NFTs on a wall, you can imagine where that could go. But this is, yeah, I think this looks the real deal. This could go a long way. Yeah, I wanted to uh, pick up on the NFTs against the wall and the frames as well. Like, it at least removes one barrier of thinking that NFTs are just a Web3 virtual scam because you can now literally portray them on your wall. So you can still link it to art in general, right? So it's cool. It's really yeah. cool. I like it a lot. Well, you could also like just print the JPEG, you know, but uh... <laughs> like go the easy route. Huh? Let, let's be positive about it. Yeah. yeah. Get this guy out of here. <laughs> First show already booted. <laughs> I'm not getting your bike in back, sorry. <laughs> so I'll hand it over to you now, Ray. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, about the Solana stuff, but next time I'm in New York, I'll definitely check it out and maybe do a little like vlog series on it. But I think it's it's important to maybe uh, for companies in the Web3 space to make this bridge into the physical traditional world of where people are still wary and, and kind of like not able to discern, you know, what what is even what is even a network and why should I buy this particular NFT on this network versus another. So I think it would be a great hub of education just for the layman who's walking around in these populated uh, cities i guess if, I, I forget where exactly in, in new york but is it like Times square i would have to look up the address because if it's in the heart of a city with a lot of you know people coming coming in and out it, it'll definitely help along those those lines of education but uh but yeah i'll um share my screen now and bring me up there we go so that was yeah, the matrix is real. So I like to just check out Crypto Slam here, now and then. And here we have the all time. And so what Silicon was mentioning earlier uh, is all of this interoperability amongst metaverse is going to happen on one chain or multiple chains. It seems like there's a lot of innovation and people trying to, I guess, take market share away from Ethereum if you want to look at it from that standpoint. But uh, by far, if we're looking at the blockchain by NFT sale volume uh, in, for all time, again, not in the 30 or seven days, we have Ethereum leading, and then you know Ronin. It it goes. It, it says something about the Ronin chain as I think Axie was the first chain or, or the first game uh, that branched off to build their own uh, chain uh, outside of Polygon, which was before Ronin, uh, I think. So, but but yeah, I just like to to browse through here and see what's happening in, in on the top blockchains as far as sales, buyers, transactions, and sellers. And if you have, if you see anything, no. Uh, worthy of mentioning here then uh definitely jump in uh, did yeah, polygon get like a huge boost with the whole disney news last week yeah so they have a, a good amount like maybe six to seven maybe eight uh, traditional companies that are jumping in and onto polygon and then uh, i think it was ryan watts uh, previously or former youtube head of gaming joined as the ceo of polygon so since then there's been a lot of you know partnerships and announcements that we never really saw before um, that's cool so yeah so does anyone know a little bit more about this flow chain of ranked fourth i've never heard this one before or i've used it actually it. one time with uh oh, uh the guys who did a, a collab with uh Star class actually uh the fabricants uh, right. they used uh they they use flow for uh, their transaction i guess on their website uh but the only time i've ever heard of it uh actually uh i was pretty surprised because i had to create new wallet i usually i don't like uh, creating new wallets on new chains that i don't know because like it becomes yeah, uh mistake, you know but uh, i really liked uh, what they do at the fabricant so i uh went with it anyway works pretty well i guess i don't have much more to say about that but uh yeah he... I'm surprised yeah, it's number three actually because I don't know what else, who else is using this. Yeah, NBA Top Shots was the one uh, is, the, is the project that's known for uh, being used and the most popular on the Flow network. So okay. I guess here oh, we go with the buyers and transactions. As you can see mm. on the left hand side on the NFT collection ranking by sales volume, uh, sales volume. Just in case anyone's not watching, there's a is list. It like of, the NBA, NBA thing is it like a, a Web three version of uh, basketball trading cards. Basically, so I didn't dive deep. I'm not the, the, the biggest sports head, but there are packages of cards that you can purchase. And I guess correct me if I'm wrong, anyone out there, but uh, I never really looked into it uh, that deep, but heard a lot about it because it did 
gain a lot of uh, attention over over the months and I guess the year of last uh, with with what it was doing. And uh, yeah, it's the, the highest volume traded NFT project on the float chain. So I guess. Yeah, sports stuff is usually really popular. Like there's also um, so rare. I don't know if you guys. Yeah, probably. Yeah. In the last 24 hours, they're they're ranking number uh, yeah, one. Yeah, number one, right? Yeah, sure. Bizarre. Like it's. Uh, I guess it's popular the same way. Like uh, trading uh, trading cards for sports. I've always been around. You know, like uh, that's why, for sure. Right. Cool. Yeah. So it's always interesting. And um, and here yeah, we go. So like this was. Mm -hmm. What I like as well is like if you look at the the right hand side, like on the fourth position, you have immu immutable X. I don't yep. know if a lot of people know about this, but it's just literally a, some sort of sub chain on Ethereum, or a, at least a project on Ethereum where they sell a lot of gaming NFTs, um, <laughs> and uh, there are zero fees in ETH to be paid. So it's very fast. They do a very good onboarding as well. You can literally buy some ETH without any form of transaction cost uh, with your credit or debit card and you can just instantly start transacting on Immutable X. If you don't know or are not familiar with the platform, I would highly recommend just go and have a look on it because it's really, really well designed and a, a nice little marketplace to use. For sure. And they have a bunch of partnerships you can see on their website. Uh, yeah. A lot of gaming centric type of partnerships. So it's awesome. Um, and then this is another one that I came, I fell upon. Uh, so what's interesting about this one is that on the far right here, you have the floor cap. So essentially what you're seeing here are the top five or ranked projects that have the floor price multiplied by the amount of uh, assets total of the project. And that's what gives you the floor cap. So the actual market cap or floor cap of the project based off of the floor price times the total amount of assets. So I thought that was pretty cool. So now, you know, Bordy Biakold obviously leading the way in different ways uh, compared to other NFT just art projects. But yeah, these are sometimes if we're just so focused on gaming, we're not really looking at the different genres of, of projects that are being built out in the space. Some of them turned into gaming projects um, after they were just PFP projects uh, focusing on art. But, um, but yeah. Two little, two little websites that I just checked to see what's going on. I uh, thought it was worth a mention, but we can hop off. And yeah, very cool. Continue. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, all of our news. If we do want to go on to Star Atlas, we can now. Let's uh, go. Yeah. So let's look at the flight first look video they released this week. Who's excited? Who's excited? Yeah, it's a pretty big one, actually. <laughs> yeah, it we is, should get uh, Twitter was more often, right? <laughs> Volume could, uh, could be increased. What I like about this, and I'll, I'll start off straight off the bat, is that the guy who's leading this project is a very big space sim enthusiast himself. So that's, I think. If you're in the game development space and you're trying to develop a game of this size and scale in outer space and you are a very big enthusiast of the genre itself, it boosts a lot of confidence in um, getting stuff right. And instantly when you start seeing this gameplay, you notice a few things. Like I know Winston also played some Star Citizen, so is also very familiar with the low gravity or zero gravity flight models. Mm -hmm. And you can instantly see that the same approach has been handled here. The, the plane, or, or the spaceship in general here, where he comments this up, I think about right here that this is a fighter model, um, yeah. reacts in a gravity-less zone. So this implies that the whole flight module will be thruster-based. So it's not linear movement. Like if you start moving in one direction and you stop applying a thrust, uh, in that direction your ship will continue moving in that direction until its speed has become this uh, limited that it stops moving in that direction so you'll have to be uh, compensating on all sides with thruster uh, inputs on maneuvering your ship in the sixth dimensional space that is space so that's really great i really enjoyed it also the little sneak alpha in there is that 
if you've seen it, he's playing with uh, flight sticks. So yeah. that confirms that we will have Hotas input support, which uh, I am beyond excited for. <laughs> Can, can you talk on what that is exactly for maybe those who aren't? Uh, so a or, or we never is a, yeah, a HOTAS is an acronym for uh, hands on stick, uh, hand on thruster and stick, um, or you could have a HOSAS, which is hands on stick and stick, or a HOSAM, which is hands on stick and mouse. So that's all different kinds of approaches. Uh, on uh, flying with uh, in games basically so it's input uh, formations uh, you can use um, of course if you fly with a hotas hosas hosam whatever your preferred method <laughs> is it uh, food pedals we don't know yet falker so that would be great to uh, get those but ultimately when you have hotas support you get food pedal support as well because it's usually tied in one package um, but yeah if, if you start flying with hotas hosam hosas uh, systems uh, it's it's just another layer of um, how do you say it? Uh, of immersion because you have flight sticks in your hand and you get sucked in to the game on a different way because now you literally feel that you're flying the thing and that's right. <laughs> yeah wax wax <laughs> But th that's lit it's it's just it's yeah it's amazing. If you ha never have experienced it, um, I could highly recommend you to do so. It will take some time to practice uh, and oh, to yeah. get good at it because it's completely different. But it's so liberating uh, to fly with sticks because um, the input levels you can get with sticks it's much finer, much preciser. Uh, than you could have with keyboard and mouse because a keyboard once you click your uh, your key like uh, most of us use a W to go forward like if you put it in that input is 100% but with flight sticks you can literally gently push your flight stick forward and that will increase in percentage wise of uh, input so it's a whole different level how long have you been playing with yours playing with my uh, flight stick cypress <laughs> yes <laughs> if we're still on that topic of uh, the sticks um, and playing with I've, I've been playing with mine for i think uh, what is it two or three months now something like that so <laughs> would you uh, would you say there's definitely going to be a competitive advantage then for people that adopt using that model um there will be, but it depends on what people are using those, because if you do PvP like dogfighting, yes, of course, flight sticks will give you a much preciser, much uh, higher input precision with flight sticks. Uh, but then again, um, there are some people who still fly with keyboard and mouse and still dominate the space uh, in dogfighting. So it's ultimately skill, but still yeah it's you have to pick what you like how you would like to play the game and ultimately uh, as well how big your budget is because flight sticks can get very expensive very easily like the one he's using right there it's a verbal constellation alpha and the flight stick alone like just the stick it's not the the thing where the stick is mounted in it's like three four hundred dollars for the stick alone and then base is another three hundred dollars or something like that so it's wow. a six seven hundred dollar flight stick and you need to have two of those to get your whole sas uh, uh setup so yeah gets yeah. expensive yeah. very fast that's interesting mm. were you guys yeah. able to hear the audio on that video i played yeah no, very low I decided okay, cool. to talk over it because <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, like shouting loud for me, so that's interesting. Yeah, it could go up a good a good amount. If we could we could watch it too, and just to hear it for those maybe um, and we we watch the scene. Yeah, let me uh, while you mix uh, it to the top. Okay. While you while it, there we go. Let's see. Hey guys, Brad here with the Star Atlas team, and we thought we'd give Any you guys other? a little sneak peek of something That's we've good. been working on. That's good. Now, to be clear, this is an internal demo, and I cannot say if or when it will make it into your hands, but it should give you guys a little taste of the progress we're making. The goal of this project was to test out our flight model and just kind of play around and see what's fun, what works, and what doesn't. So this is just a fun little mini game that we built. 
You start with five seconds on the timer, and every gate you fly through and target you hit adds time to your timer, with the objective being to get to the finish before time runs out. Big shout out to my fellow members of the Mud Faction. Humanity first. Sorry, not no, sorry. No. Now I would like to note for the record that the ship I'm flying is not a racing ship. It is in fact a freighter. So if it looks like it handles like a pregnant whale, that is by design. But as you can see, I have my OTAS set up. Um, that was something that was very important to me to get joystick support because no self-respecting pilot flies with a mouse and keyboard. Despite this ship not yet having an interior, because it's still a work in progress, I still prefer this first-person view. I've always flown that way. I'm just a huge Space Sim fan. I love all of them. I've got literally thousands of hours on the stick. So for me to be able to work on this game is really just a dream come true. And I know everyone on this team feels the same way. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little peek behind the curtain. Um, thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this without you guys. But hold on to your butts, because there's a lot more alpha coming your way soon. Yeah, I, th I think that in, at the end when he finishes, the, and he has his time up there, it's, we're facing a planet. And I'm not sure, but maybe we can make out some structures there. Um, I did take a look at it and, um, earlier, but I'm you know, again, it's from top down. You might not be able to, to say what it is exactly, but there's definitely some something happening on the, on the planet uh, looking down at looking down at it but uh but yeah i think um as far as full immersion with the sticks and all uh it's gonna cost a pretty penny so i don't know what percentage of the population of gamers play yeah are gonna and, be able uh, to also have a rig that can play the game and then if they wanted to get the sticks to to, to fly yeah i was wondering what he's uh what suit he's wearing as well because you see some like really high-tech suits out there homemade no yeah, similar to like what you saw in like Ready Player One. Mm -hmm. Almost there. Uh, the date on that sort of technology. There's uh, like the running omnidirectional track. Uh, what's it called? Yeah. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah. But, but I agree very much with uh, Romega's comment from earlier. Uh, if you are, for example, like the guy in the turret, in the ship, you will be probably much more efficient with a uh, mouse yeah. instead of uh, a flight stick, because like you're yes. just you're sitting in your seat, you're just shooting, right? So you will be much much more efficient like this. Yes. Judging that's from why... like just our citizen, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's why uh, we specify that it's a flight model, of course, right? Hmm. That's why you want flight sticks for a flight model. Yeah. Like, when I play Star Citizen and sit in the turret, I always use my mouse as well because it's much easier to do then. And it's going to be so, interesting when we get our hands on this. Uh, so 15 gates, 30 targets, and there's a timer that's always going down, but extends when you go through a gate. So there does seem like it would be something with big boards on it, and uh, that's always interesting. This perhaps could be like the first chance at like player versus player combat, even though it's not really yeah. top PvP. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good time to ask the two guys that have got the technology. If he's getting 30 seconds, what time would you two get? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it depends yeah. on which ship we get to use, uh, to use to fly these things as well, right? That's so a good answer. That, if we get that, that freighter whale he mentions, or we get a racing ship, then things will get very different very fast. Yeah. This could be the first iteration, like we're saying, of something where we're competing as a community just for time and yeah. one specific ship, very elementary. So look forward to that. Yeah, it was uh, interesting. Uh, good guy Tony brought up. It kind of looks like a mud cosplay sort of thing instead of like a haptic soup, perhaps. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> I think yeah. it's cosplay, yeah. Probably. <laughs> it's a character. I wonder if, like, in, in that sort of thing, if uh, there'd be any advantage to only multiple, or if it'd just be you need to have one ship to be able to play it. He said in the video it was a transport, I think, or freighter. So, yeah, uh, which uh, we so already saw before one time mm -hmm. from the trailer, right? Yeah, there's uh, been a few of them now. No, it's like a, I think it's a ship from uh, the the actual um, cinematic trailer we saw, like the Floyd ship. Do you remember oh, that one? Uh, do you mean uh, at the very end after 
where it kind of replays like the very first trailer they showed us uh, yeah but wasn't that of zeus or pot flying into the base uh no no, no this one, I mean, yeah, yeah. This one. i think it's the same ship because yeah, um, this a while ago michael he, he did tweet like uh but we already saw this ship before in some content they released so i think it has to be this one right hmm. and the floyd line we haven't seen any ship from that uh manufacturer yet i think yeah Good. uh assume it'll be op since uh floyd is like the last name of the main developer so it could be his favorite we know chip uh, is maybe. the rainbow arc yeah yeah cool good spot so yeah that kind of leaves us the alluvian ceo over star atlas ceo today and uh yeah there's a lot to go through on that Everybody yeah. go grab some popcorn again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Round three. I, I think I think it's been exhausted on on Twitter space. There's been a lot of like uh, uh, groups of people coming together and hosting like uh, platforms to talk on this debate that Kagi I guess hosted and moderated uh, between Alluvium co well, one of the Alluvium employees I'll say named Karen uh, with Alluvium and then uh, the CEO of Star Atlas uh, for Star, for Star Atlas. Uh, so yeah, we can get into a clip and then see and talk on it because uh, there's a, there's I would say there's a lot to take away from what was said. There's some I, I would say maybe potential alpha information that we, maybe we we never knew before. Maybe not alpha, but there's some there's, a, there's some information that we could benefit from just from watching it more than once or talking about it, getting different people's points of views. Yeah, to me it seemed less like a debate and more like Wagner having the opportunity to explain his product to two different games audiences so he did it quite well uh it got a bit heated during the middle and uh there are definitely some interesting clips i think uh the most underrated parts of the interview was at the very beginning where uh wagno uh, kagi does a sponsor and <laughs> it's the first thing that uh wagner mentions as he comes in let's have a look at that Is this muted? Yes, it is. Pokemon slash unified tactics. Perfect, perfect. Yo, Wagner, what about your project? Your project is a massive, massive, massive project. I know you hit it here and back by saying, yo, your game can be a mini game in our world. And, you know, I kind of see it that way, but, you know, Kieran doesn't see it that way. Now, jump into your project and explain to people what your project is all about. Yeah, of course. Uh, and Kagi, we didn't get the pre-approval for the uh, wax promotion there at the beginning, but since that's out of the way and we're going, and uh, we love what you do at the Juice Team, uh, really happy to be here. So thanks for putting this together. Kieran, uh, again, happy to have this conversation with you here. Um, you know, I do hold the integrity of our company and of our project to uh, the highest standards and so i think it's important that we kind of clear the air and get down to the facts of what's what's going on what we're building and what our vision is so yeah so that's the first clip and yeah i really enjoyed that i uh, actually laughed out loud when he said that uh, there was hey, another Dad. moment in this where uh wagner was like i don't even think about you that got another chuckle out of me yeah so, I, I think this is a more of an interview is, uh, what we'll call it in my opinion and then also uh, because of the amount of time that Wagner was speaking and the amount of questions that was asked uh, of him but then also the amount the level of professionalism is just totally off the charts when it when in comparison to both Kagi and you know not to down talk anyone or to throw shade in any way it's just that we've probably all watched interviews and things and how things should be structured uh, before and after while you're live and for for the example you just showed with the the mini promotion without it being talked about behind the scenes, like these are pretty pretty important things to to talk about and to to not have done if you're having people come on um, as far as for it either being a debate or an interview uh, without mentioning it, I guess. But you know, uh, just want to throw it out there. It's it's interesting. I did go into it if I'm honest, thinking it would be scripted to some degree as a comment. In there from good guy Tony that says it was a it did feel a little bit scripted like an infomercial like he says because it was one way traffic it definitely wasn't a debate it was much closer to an interview but that little gaff at the start with the wax thing that just kind of make me feel that yeah it was 
real and legit because if it was pre-planned i don't think you'd have that you know for sure yeah, and we've had Wag, we've had a uh, CAG on before, so it's quite funny that he uh, did that, like very cheeky, and uh, yeah, I liked it. I think the next clip we have is about Kieran and how he thinks the community views him and how he sees himself. And uh, it's a bit of a monologue, but it kind of engulfs the whole interview a lot. He uh, makes his case and doesn't really budge on it. Right. Now, Kieran, how do you see the web, uh, web three, or not web three? How do you see game development? How is game development supposed to be? Because I see a lot of people taking shots at Star Atlas. Not only you, some other developers out there that they don't mention Star Atlas. Sometimes they put little pictures and then they, you know, they hint or something, and they say, oh well, they have a, you know, they're, a, they're kind of outsourcing or whatever. How are you building your game? How are you building your game? How do you think games should be built? Yeah, so let's let's probably just draw it back, right? Because I have somehow I've I've gotten this image, or, or I don't even know this this people have this idea of me as this troll guy who just hates on projects and you know is out there to just destroy and mock other projects for no reason whatsoever, right? And to be honest, like, it's it's just nonsensical. I don't have the time. The only time that I'll step in is when I believe that a Web3 project is taking advantage of potentially naive, very new adopters to Web3 gaming. And the reason I step in and try and protect them is they are critical for mass adoption, right? The, the first million people that come in here and are active players, they're going to bring the next 10 million and the next 100 million and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that was an interesting point. And uh, he kind of just lays out his case there. What did you guys think? I think an interesting, he's picked up on uh, or the inferences of Star Atlas exploiting people's naivety that are new to the space, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm not overly familiar with the practices of Alluvium. Um, so if any of you guys that are familiar with it, what makes them so special? How have they not uh, exploited naivety? They haven't sold... I think uh, that's exactly what they did. Right? Mm, they sold tokens, not uh, like the... I guess the like uh, the creatures you're gonna use for battle in uh, Illuvium, you don't buy them like we buy the ship from Star Atlas. I guess that's what he's trying to get at. But then I guess you're gonna need the tokens too. So what difference does it make in the end? Uh, it's uh, hard to tell. For now, I think. Yeah, yeah, they are big on trying to balance the game, and they believe releasing like assets it's unfair. So they think that's just like a, a law of developing a blockchain game where you don't release it until you can like use it. So all they have is like the skins that would be like really cool when they are usable. Just like uh, they are all like shiny and look like they are worth something. So and they get they give away a lot of them during like uh, giveaways and Twitter competitions that sort of thing. Yeah, I think when they first came on the scene as Alluvium before they even existed in anyone's mind or, or in the or in, in the space in general they came in guns blazing and i was there during that whole debacle of a, of a world war three more or less between the communities of alluvium which some prominent ogs of axie hopped over to then fully support and then there was a lot of um, discussion and arguing about whose project was best or, or crap um, and you know karen did the exact same thing now that he did then and it didn't necessarily help anyone but himself and the people who joined the cult of, you know, and I say cult because, or the community, I would say like, uh, but there was, it was pretty extreme, ex extreme emotions back then. And since then it was just like alluvium bros, like nothing could break them apart. And it, it was a different vibe, I'd say, compared to even after what happened, the community of Axie Infinity and then other projects that were coming up and being talked about or invested in at the time. So. I always lean towards this. This was being a marketing stunt, being, giving him the benefit of the doubt, um, just to help get more eyes and attention uh, of uh, of different communities on Olivia. 
but it, it, this, you know, I don't, I don't approve of what he's doing. But he says in the in this little clip we just played that he doesn't have the time. But we, as active community members, know what you guys are doing as far as CEOs, depending on how active you are with your communities and what you're doing. So if mo most of Karen's time is going towards Twitter shit posting, and then sometimes, but also in his own Discord, doing the same thing about other projects, then that's where his time is going because we don't have a whole roadmap of his daily schedule. We see majority of time dedicated to th this type of stuff. Um, and if I don't know, then please inform me other, uh, about other things he does, but yeah. Yeah, he cried wolf once and he was right and uh, he's got the confidence to do it again. Uh, and like, the ending of the interview is quite funny. He uh, says if everything goes right, you'll all be millionaires, but uh, he doesn't see it happening or something like that. We'll have to get to that point later. Yeah, I do have a question for everyone listening in the in the chat as well. Does it make you want to have a look at Alluvium, having watched that and take part? Because I also have great concerns about all projects for mass adoption and stuff. It is really important that we set a good standard across all games and get new people in. 100% I feel that way. However, I, I really don't think, and that's going to be an undertone as we break this down, going about it this way and creating this kind of media, is that going to bring new people in? Because I'm not well, sure. For for, for Karen's, uh, I think it would bring people who are in Web3 to Alluvium in a way as far as like it on their it's on their radar now as a game, like it wasn't before because of all the new games that are popping up and being advertised and shared by content creators um, or just in articles and, and, and in the news. But as far as a traditional gamer or someone who never had any exposure to anything and they just watch that for what it is, in my opinion, I wouldn't consider Alluvium as any top five of a project to look into. Uh, I would still look at what they have and, you know, the gameplay footage and maybe look at the tokenomics. But if my if I only have a certain amount of bandwidth as far as time, attention, and finances, I think I wouldn't place Olivia in the top five. Uh, and I would definitely consider Star Atlas as something I would put more time in, um, into as far as research and potential investment. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I get uh, that. Go on. I feel like Kanat's just raised a good point there, really. Considering it was supposed to be a debate for Alluvium and Star Atlas, it definitely got my attention about Alluvium again, but I didn't walk away from that video feeling like I knew a lot more about that project than I did before, but I, yeah. Yeah, I'm interested to see how it plays out. Uh, who will be bigger like when all the ink is dry? And mm. yeah, because all of these little debates, if there's more of them, they'll definitely be very fun to like look back on when there is a clear answer yeah Shall we have a look at on, the... uh, on Thor's comment here uh, on screen right now I'm already involved in Alluvium but that interview really only made me think about Star Atlas uh, and improve my opinion of the game um, it's something like we all uh, agreed upon that this whole discussion or uh, monologue to say so uh, has boosted the confidence in uh, either Michael Wagner uh, and or Star Atlas in a whole. So that's a big kudos to what he achieved uh, right there. So Yeah. Yeah. Even though like, he was at some times, maybe you could say he was like stalling a little bit at some questions, maybe because he wasn't sure how to answer everything, of course. But uh, it was definitely like heavily focused on, it's like Star Atlas AMA basically, yeah, for sure. Like the same questions uh, Kieran was asking to uh, Wagner wasn't asked back towards Illusion at all. Yeah. yeah. So our next clip is one you recommended, Winston. So it's about oh yeah uh, the in-house development on the Unreal Engine Five side. So let's have a look at that. With no compromises and no vulnerabilities, I might add. So, uh, um, you know, again, very qualified. Now, getting into art production and game direction, this is obviously Danny's camp. Chief Sorry, can, you just go, can we just go back there? You said how many devs or engineers do you have, like including Solidity and uh, Rust and uh, your actual gameplay, your Unreal devs? Uh, including Unreal devs uh, internal. We have, so we have 40 across those four different departments. This includes Unreal devs. Uh, it includes our How many uh, Unreal engine. devs do you, do you have internally? Internally is probably four today. 
So let me get to let me get to the other component of this, which is uh, this idea of outsourcing. These are co-creation studios. I'm happy to pull up a screen here if, if you'd like me to share it. We've spoken about. Should I should I share the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you guys, I, I told both of you, if you guys have anything new to share or want to share something, go ahead. Yeah. Um, let's do it. I have a bunch of content here we can run through if we want. Um, but let me just start with Spearsoft. This is one of the studios um, that we've announced the relationship with and the partnership with. Um, specifically in Spearsoft, we have 58 uh, team members. And I do consider them team, mem team members. These are full-time, 100% dedicated personnel working exclusively on Star Atlas. Now, in addition to that, we have another, uh, and you can see here the type of teams that they work with. By the way, this idea of co-creation or co-development studios, it's not new to building games. You can see Ubisoft, Electronic Arts, DICE, NetherRealm, right? Outer Worlds, Diablo, these are the types of games and products that they work on. This is a full suite game development studio. So um, I, I can't tell you exactly uh, what the breakdown of their uh, team members are, but it's everything. Like we actually do all of the art production. So their team is specifically tasked with integrating our art and working in Unreal Engine and building out the game in Unreal Engine. 50. So yeah, uh, they have like, I guess this is to me, this was like the biggest question out of this uh, entire interview. Uh, so they're supposed to have like seven uh, co-development studios, right? Uh, so like probably 200 guys uh, from different companies. They, but they, I assume they don't talk to each other. They all talk to Automata. And in their internal team, they have four guys that I guess have to piece everything together and make the game. So how does that work? And second, just the way he answered the question, he was obviously like not very comfortable. Like, oh, I probably have four guys. like. What do you mean probably like uh, he should know this right of course he knows but i guess maybe they have trouble recruiting devs and like he's a bit shy about uh, admitting it on camera i don't know like what do you guys think i i think he um composed himself in a in the best way possible i know karen mm -hmm. was trying to probe him to get the exact number as he had to ask again how many within star atlas not across all of these higher um i guess companies and although it's only four, I can imagine that the difficulty in how many devs are out there in the space that have the time and effort and maybe the, uh, the interest to, to join up, um, and to help build out Star Atlas in this way that we're all going to get to eventually. Um, so there, there is a scarce amount of developers, and this has been an ongoing problem uh, of across course, the networks. Yeah. So, so building out these, you know, even Solana. Um, but yeah, I, I think. I think he did okay. Uh, it, it does it does show maybe something if you go deeper than just like the first three layers of the surface, where it just he just didn't say it was four uh, right out the gate because Karen didn't ask it uh, in a non-specific way. Uh, but I guess it, I guess uh, uh, Wagner considers everyone who's working on the project as an employee, right? Maybe he doesn't differentiate anyone in Star Atlas as much as Karen is trying to in this in this conversation mm -hmm. where he's saying the project of Star Atlas is comprised of all of these people, all of these great minds and all of this talent. And yeah, we have 40 people working on it because that's the truth. There are people working on it, but if you're gonna nitpick and yeah. say how many are with Star Atlas, then it's just like, ah, oh, we got you. You know, maybe to trying to bait him into, but again, you can't control what everyone's gonna think after the fact. And I'm not an expert myself. So is this a big deal? Should we be totally concerned with our investments if that's how we're looking at it? Just because there's only but four and then, uh, yeah, that, Kieran, yeah, like, he, yeah. Um, he licked his lips after Wagner said that. Right. <laughs> like he's uh, ready to pounce. He found uh, like a yeah. nugget. Yeah, um, but that raised the question, right? Like, is this normal? Like, it, how common is this to outsource this much in the video game world? You know, like, uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know the question. I'm legitimately asking, like, is this normal or not? It's completely normal in some instances, like you just with the example you just gave, sometimes with new titles, they'll outsource the entire project to somebody else to make it, right? In this instance, especially with Sperisoft being the example, looking at the track record and the people in that project, outsourcing to them, and this is just my opinion, especially during the initial phase, when I found out they were working with them and a lot of people were doing it, it gave it a whole lot more credibility to me because I thought, hang on, I've played a hell of a lot of those products. I love them. Like the example says, it's a very common practice. And yeah, mm -hmm. quite frankly, if you've got the money to hire experts to do the job for you, do it. 
you don't have to employ them yourselves, especially if you're starting off. Maybe in due time, they should look to expand their core team and such. But as a starting point, if you can afford the best, go and get them. doesn't mm. seem like a bad idea to me. And I certainly wouldn't be laughing about it either if they can afford Sperisoft. Exactly. There's yeah, two things I, I want to add on, on that whole debate is... Uh, I think at one point, if you try to hire everyone uh, inside your own uh, office buildings or like literally in-house, it would also limit uh, some key points on game development, I believe. Like now you hire different companies who might be specialized in different areas of game development, have different experiences, different backgrounds and different interests and hobbies which reflect in game development as well, right? Um, so that could be a thing. And then secondly, I do believe there was a little bit further down in the clip uh, a comment that Wagner didn't want to go any further into details on team and who they're hiring from or something like that because Kieran has been known to poach uh, team members from Star Atlas. Stuff like yeah, that. So we do have another clip lined up and it is like a continuation of the conversation. Just skip yeah, a bit. Yeah, see? So it's, it's a tricky one, right? Yeah. I guess, was it your initial plan to build internally and not outsource any devs, or what? Or did that? First of all, again, just on the 180 number, uh, I'd love to see the interview that you're referring to, so we can get clarification on that. I've always referred to total team size, so so we we can take a peek. But um, in terms of scalability, it was indeed always part of our plan to be able to scale as rapidly as possible. What's the best method of doing that? It's hiring the most qualified teams from around the world to work with us directly. The only way you get to approximately 240 people over the course of, now we've been around for what, 19 months, but realistically, most of last year was about presenting the vision and laying some of the fundamental and foundational pieces of game development. So our hiring didn't really start until, excuse me, our, our, our uh, recruiting didn't really start until like late Q3, early Q4. <laughs> so the only way you get to 240 people in less than a year is by utilizing some of the best external studios in the world so it's a very successful I mean, and attractive we, we methodology. have done that so i don't like so that you recognize it yeah we, so you recognize we, that it's a it's a solid and sound strategy for growing a team no um, no 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 as in as in i'm saying sorry to clarify that it is possible alluvium has done that we have outsourced uh two environments to two external teams very transparent about that we've got about mm -hmm. 12 people working on each one but yep. when we quote our numbers, that's our internal team. And we built it in maybe 14 months. So maybe your statement of you can't do it in 12 is correct. But okay. certainly, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have half of our resources coming from external studios. Yeah, so it is interesting. It, like a lot of the debate comes down to just their different types of approaches. And um, I guess the unwillingness to like leave there's another way of doing things from Kieran's path so yeah well doesn't it also boil down to the scope of the games like Illuvium is tied to a creature based strategy game where it's a much smaller world <laughs> in comparison to what Star Atlas is trying to build so ultimately I do believe that at some point there might be some restrictions and limitations which would apply to either both of the projects which do not apply to the other one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Would be nice also to know like uh, who does what with the co-development studios they are hiring? Like uh, I guess have more details like is it just art or is it like everything else? Like uh, I don't know. Like, it would be nice to have a little bit more details about that I guess. From the town hall they did with Spirisoft and the guys from the security, Kudelski, uh, prior to this whole debate uh, in their Discord, there was some sort of mention that the whole concept art and proofing and stuff like that was done inside uh, in-house with from Automata. And mm -hmm. mostly that the Spirisoft team right now has uh, the highest priority to finishing up the showroom piece if i'm not mistaken so correct me on that if i'm wrong but i think it was something like that at least yes yeah i think that's that's what we heard on the town hall and uh Falk has just made probably the most important point that they don't touch on in the debate 
but these teams you can't even if you've got all the money in the world when it comes to developing a project like this you can't just headhunt or hire people stick them in a room and tell them to go especially in game development look throughout the years and the histories of games of when teams expand and it car crashes their development they have to delay and there's crunch you can't just bring people together and click your fingers they're bringing in a team of people that know how to work together and in terms of delivering and getting things done quickly and efficiently that's so massive so massive and i just don't see why having people that have good chemistry could ever be perceived to be a bad thing it's a good thing and probably the most important thing to hitting timelines and deadlines exactly yeah it's similar to building a house you know you can hire a bunch of people your friends and family and maybe some co- like some individuals who went to school that you know of who did carpentry and things of that nature but then if you know there's a company who's fitted to just build it within a certain amount of time because of, they have the blueprints and everything that you're going to need it's just like it's a no-brainer on that end uh to then spend it because you get what you pay for you know so if you're if you're seeking the best of the best and this is what startless has and that's what they're paying for then expect similar uh experiences based off of uh, the games that you played prior like brad was saying uh for why he even was interested in star atlas because there's people who built these other games that i'm gonna have similar experiences to the quality you know it's, it's gonna be there so I, I think you know alluvium and for everyone on that team doing as much as they could in-house uh, maybe they didn't have enough money and that's why they had to act and do things in a certain way to then raise and to to get enough attention to then potentially hire out some some things to get done you know like again all speculative who knows the concrete goals that they had in the beginning and how it changed for why they had to hire to get those two maps done but yeah uh, across the space there is a lack of money i know that the karen brothers come from uh, a background of creating an exchange and there might have been money made there um but yeah for why they didn't just hire out to get it done maybe sooner than later who knows yeah so in the next clip uh kieran goes in a bit of a rant about uh just his grievances and uh team size it's uh yeah it does get a bit spicy during this video and i think kagi's personality uh really turned up it wasn't like a very professional setting i enjoyed it build internally i i, you I have might a as lot well. of people questioning your projects and rightfully so like you gotta recognize that dude like you i mean I, it's 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 just insane to me that you're Kieran, dismissing that outside of you my friend we don't have anybody questioning our team size no. what yeah hey, it's, look at your youtube comments like bro come on like we gotta <laughs> okay okay well you can't I, base it on youtube comments all right look i, I, I'm but, a, I, I mean I, yeah. like okay, you okay. base it on the videos that developers have created and are saying like this doesn't make sense you if you're saying that you don't have an open-ended question out there across crypto twitter mainstream gaming devs if, if you think you don't have that question mark then you're oblivious like i'm sorry that like, you do until you re- we had it the reason i know this is because we literally had thousands of people saying your game is bullshit you can't build it that quickly now the reason why i get so frustrated is because it was freak luck it was ridiculous ambition it was so much hard work for us to build an internal team to get a beta out in 12 months that has 11,000 well, you, you said you said 7 it. months you said 7 months so you know the hey, hey what, you, sorry? you said you said 7 months for your beta so you know you got to you, you know you also oh, with the, you also with the de- delay you also delayed you also delayed so that yeah, yeah, no, uh, let's be fair I- yeah so uh <laughs> i i do enjoy his points and i can see how if he doesn't know much about the project it doesn't like you can't really tell how deep it is unless you dive into it because there's just so many ways they get information out there and you have to dig in yeah there's a lot of variables for every project and there could have been way more talking points we didn't really talk tokenomics anything along white papers or econ papers right so uh, where they are where they are on the timeline of that outside of just how many different, there was so much time that, that was invested into just who's building the game why they're doing that you didn't you're not doing it like me uh karen seems like he's scraping the bottom of the barrel just to to get some type of um i guess negative blanket place over, over star atlas or him as wagner uh, like it was just the, the attempts 
were more humorous to me than, than anything else. But all the information is out there. You know, like it literally is just the time you have to take to educate yourself. And then, you know, we as content creators do what we can uh, with what's given to us or what's public to help that along. But yeah. Uh, you were yeah. going to say something, Brett? Yeah, no, I just find that the phrasing of it really interesting because it is a bit of, it's, you know, you can't say in past tense, we had those doubts, we saw this stuff and make out that that was a thing, but you've now hit a deadline and go on to say how much hard work goes into it if you're going to achieve it. You're not that special and nobody in this space is. If any, if some person can do it in that amount of time, you know, there's no reason to assume other people aren't as competent as you are, you know? For sure. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, my favorite bit from that little rant was uh, I was you, Kieran saying that, is implying he's like some future version of uh, yeah. Wagner. <laughs> that, that's it, right? And yeah. by that token, he knows that it's completely doable, in his mind at least. So what's the issue? Mm -hmm. Some people might, take, may, might need a little bit more time or a little bit more funds or a little bit more help. That's why they hire out. But it's just like the superiority complex of him on some level, and I'll, I'll throw that out there, um, is just almost like he's already grown and learned from this and he's trying to help retailers from getting shafted by Star Atlas specifically, and by Axie at the time when he did what he did, and by any other projects that the actual community might have heard him talk negatively about. Because I wasn't just living in the Discord checking to see and keeping tabs on Karen, but I, without a doubt over these publicly, you know, Twitter posted shit talkings, are with the major projects that are out here getting and having events that are garnering a lot of support and attention. It's just like, you're just riding the coattails at this point of the, the most popular projects when they are the most popular uh, to some of them. After you've gone and raised a $10 million check, so how much have you raised in total? Yeah. So we've sold over $200 million worth of checks. Jesus Christ. Okay, so you've you've gone and sold two hundred million dollars worth of NFTs, right? For a game that's going to be available in three to five years. And my problem with that is you've gone and done sales to businesses like or VCs like Animoca, right? So Animoca are sitting on three million dollars i don't know if they bought more or sold some or whatever but they're sitting on three million dollars worth of star atlas ships the equivalent of that would be a framework went and bought three million dollars worth of our tier five alluvials you know what would happen our game would be fun it would be pay to win literally if you get in early and buy these ships you're going to wait wait, wait. 200 million dollars is nothing for a game of the uh, of the scope of star atlas that's, i'm just saying i'm just saying nothing. i'm just saying i don't know, you know i didn't dig i didn't dig very deep but what i'm saying is you're literally selling ships to vcs like animoca starts star atlas when everyone else does and has three million dollars worth of assets how do you even balance that like how if i'm a player coming in and and second part to this is it's an mmo so i'm trying to work out like an MMO, I've played probably seven of the largest MMOs growing up, and I'm obsessed with them. Yes, it's sir. all about the journey, right? In your case, a lot of that journey would be going and crafting and building these ships. Mm -hmm. But you decided to not go and raise money and then do a TGE where you raise more money. You guys decided to double down and start selling these ships even though it's going to screw with the balance i'm it's not just what well, okay so no, can you explain that no i mean think about think about what you just said three million dollars with respect to over 200 million dollars in sales today Keep that represents mind, I'm, I just, than... put, just just before you go on there i just pulled out a single thing i don't know sure. how many ships you've sold to vcs or whatever like i'm saying pre-sales there's been two hundred million dollars. It doesn't really matter who it goes to. I just thought I'd pull out Animo. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. I mean, there's several, there's several inaccuracies there. So let me first start by saying that Animoca Brands is not a VC. <laughs> there. Yeah, that was a uh, quite uh, long-winded, but uh, it does again get his point across. But uh, he doesn't really have the homework to be doing an hour-long debate like this, in my personal opinion. 
there's a lot of yeah. things uh, he's just unaware of. Yeah. Yeah. And as he said, like, uh, I don't know, like $3 million worth of ships, if you divide it like by the entire community, I think most big, big guilds, they probably have somewhere in that range, maybe, I guess. Like, it's not, uh, I don't know. Okay. And it's not, they need the players, first of all, to like use their assets. So I, I don't know. I, I think it, it could be balanced in some way. Like, uh, even if you have like a lot more, uh, it's not just about throwing money. Maybe in the early stage where it's like going to be death ball <laughs> kind of style of gameplay. But uh, even so, like, if the map is large enough, you can just spread it out and like probably like have a, smaller groups of players can just do their thing and not be uh, totally crushed by big guilds. I don't know, like there, there's lots of options to balance this out, I think. Yeah, like, like this is kind of where it all starts to fall apart, the constructive criticism, if we can call it that at this point. Like, firstly, he's right. These big MMO games, we're all, a lot of us are in it for the journey and the experience, right? But if you boil it down, I can understand why there might be an argument to start with, say, a base level of ship and then you have to craft in game or whatever, but that's fine. At the end of the day, what we've purchased is a spaceships, vehicles, right? That doesn't stop our experience to actually play and do the activities in game, the political decisions and that journey of experiencing the product. That's not affected by the ships. Yeah, sure, having more of them in the political, but you can make that argument. But the actual content of the game, we don't even know what that's going to be yet. How do we know it's going to be pay to win? Right now with the staking and stuff, that's fine. But there's so many possibilities and different gameplay loops that are going to be out there. It's a very broad stroke to say everything's pay to win. So, you know, there are going to be people in there that plan to play the game just to sell stuff or run stores and things like that. It doesn't make that pay to win, right? It's a very broad statement, and that's kind of it. When you're attacking a project that's so open ended and ambitious, you can't just declare it pay to win. It's just uneducated, quite frankly. Yeah, I want to pick up on that last statement you made there. Like, if if he goes on and say like, what if a VC buys three million worlds of tier five alluviums? So Let's assume that tier 5 has the highest rarity or quality of an Illuvium you can get, like the max rank Pokemon, to put it in the perspective. Um, yeah, then you would have an issue, of course, because that's end game content. But we don't know yet what these ships will do, how they are balanced against each other, because that's still a very detailed missing point that it's still not there in the, uh, in everything we know so far we got this uh, percentage wise calculation point or index on the difference between a medium and a large component but it doesn't say anything about is there uh, the same difference between a small and a medium component or an extra small and a small component stuff like that so we just don't know and because this game star atlas is this big and it will have so many different game loops you will need this mass, uh, massive amount of different ships to facilitate a starting point in this game. Like, what if the components we start crafting tomorrow inside the game will level up via, like, we know that at some point when you start crafting stuff, right, for one uh, faction or another, that you will level up in uh, your perfection on making a component. You will, you will need um, less resources over time to build a higher quality component of this manufacturer. What if some components become rarer and they, um, you'd be able to craft a component with like 15% less uh, resources, but then again, on the other end, it comes out and it actually has a 10% stat boost. So you will need people to start building stuff, which you can then implement in the spaceships you bought with standard components and thus upgrading your ships. But ultimately, the whole, the key point for me, and I've said it a few times on stream, on camera, the key point for me for every game of a large scope is having a sandbox team who is literally, uh, whose literal only job is to keep balance in everything the game does. Yeah, it's what's going to keep the game uh, playable <laughs> and not having uh, people just leave the game because of things of things like that like Axie Infinity is is at that point I think now where they have a dedicated team giving constant patches and updates to the actual game so anyone who might have played it before as the example we're talking about now with Tilkin and with Star Atlas there's going to need to be a dedicated amount of people for that uh, and yeah, then I think, all... mm -hmm. 
you've hit something with Axie though, right? Because obviously now we've got the semi-free-to-play element in there where you can get your trial axes and stuff. You know, there's part of this argument that I was kind of thinking when I heard that. You know, one thing I'd like to do with Star Atlas is time allowing is to also have a fresh separate account where I just play from scratch or as close to free to play. You know, if you really want the full journey, there's nothing stopping you going in and just trying the product with the cheapest ships possible and just playing the game, right? Just because other people have expensive stuff doesn't mean you have to as well. If you want the journey, you can just start from the bottom and work your way up. Yeah, because think about it, at any point with any games that are paid to play or paid to win type of games, people come in at different points in time and might not have money, but there's already an existing ecosystem with those people who are either early, who paid what they did to get what they have, to have you know, somewhat advantage, maybe some, maybe not. Um, but you're still going to play the game. So I understand on the onset of joining a game or a community or a new industry of gaming where you're just like, hey, how much is this is going to be an actual genuine experience where I'm going to be able to earn and create and build something for, my, for myself that's profitable in the long run versus everyone's been here, three, the, the VCs got everything, and not, now, I'm, now I'm screwed as a, as a, as a person coming in. I, I just There's so many variables and details to talk about, like token and and you mentioned, Brad, um, that especially Star Atlas compared to because what is what is Alluvium? In my in my opinion, it's a open world. And Kagi maybe in, this, in, a, in a clip here will we'll bring it up. But Kagi even mentions how it's not an open world MMO RPG type of game that we know of because you get portal to a triangle to a rectangle to then you know battle these alluvials to then potentially win and then you know morph them if you get three of the same. And it's just like where over time, doesn't that get stale, right? What else is Illumium going to do to, to, to evolve the game into where you can have a first-person shooter with other people who are the, the actual avatars instead of focusing on alluvials with this type of getting portaled into a rectangle to then battle to then win, and then you just harvest resources? Like, what else is happening in the world? And but maybe I don't do, know enough about the project, but... Yeah, you want that. Points. Like. I, I don't see myself like firing up and yet again I'm going to use the example of Pokemon because in my opinion that's what Illuvium really uh, f tries to facilitate in Web3, right? So I, I, I'm not firing up like an old Game Boy loading in Pokemon and then try to uh, FPS play against another Pokemon trailer or something like that. Like if I buy into this game I'm expecting a tactical uh, Pokemon battle style game. And if they were to deteriorate to an FPS style of game, I would raise some serious questions. Like, because literally you're breaking your own IP to build something else. So that's really strange, uh, to me at least. But um, I had two more things to add to uh, what Brad was saying with, uh, with the, the, the stuff on... Uh, the fresh account and stuff like that but yeah. if, if you played any MMO uh, in your past uh, most likely m most of us would at least had have some uh, experience with World of Warcraft in one way or another either by a friend or a relative playing the game or by playing it yourself of seeing somebody else playing it over time there's one thing that always strikes you with an MMO and it's it will always boil down to a joint cooperation of players trying to achieve a similar goal inside the game whether that's killing the end boss in a pve environment or battling it out in a pvp content that's something that every mmo tries to do like get a group of people together form a community and play as a group so I don't really see the issue with VCs buying huge amounts of ships because as um, uh, I forgot your name, <laughs> excuse me, um, Winston just said that uh, VCs would ultimately need the players as well to fly those ships, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. So it's, it's, it's a bit yin and yang there. So it, it's a difficult statement to, to say like it's either A or B because there's a little bit of a gray zone in, in between. Yeah, so after uh, Anna Monica Brands uh, got thrown into it, Wagner defended their honor and uh, skipped through a couple of minutes of that. And uh, this is Wagner's response on like, just the general uh, rant. And here we go. Um, yeah, look, I, I mean, thank you. Honestly, we, we collaborate <laughs> with, I mean, I haven't seen any of it, but hey, we, we've heard about it. But uh, look, 
we, but you talk you talk about a lot of things that you haven't seen or haven't researched like pretty obviously so you've heard things you, a lot of hearsay i mean dude all i would be all i'd be doing if i was you is putting out some actual gameplay and i have none of that to look at so what do you want me to go on like genuinely yeah, yeah well we what we do is demonstrate progression over time so uh, right this is why we've been releasing these videos you talk about us using uh you know off the shelf assets i do want to clarify we don't use any mega scan libraries in our game development whatsoever and i know what you're going to point to and it's probably that one video re we released that had the ue5 mannequin in it and yes we do use placeholder assets as we're working through various um aspects of the well. that's, content that's production not, I mean, yeah. yeah yeah that's yeah that's I, I didn't even know you'd, you'd release that, but, um, no, I yeah, see, I look. see a new gameplay. Somebody said on, 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 you know, and I'm not trying to take sides here, guys, by the way. Some people are like, oh, you're taking sides, blah, blah, blah. Look, I like Illuvium as much as I like Star Atlas. I like both. They're both my, my dads. Um, although Kieran kind of denied me as a dad, uh, but you know, like all trolls aside, I respect these two guys very much. I'm not taking. Yeah. And, uh, that, that clip, I believe, really should have been played longer for Kieran. That was like yeah. five seconds of it. And uh, there's definitely a lot of things that could have been loaded up and uh, shown during that for both games, just to give the viewers uh, who don't know much about the other game uh, more of an insight. What do you guys think? At some point, Kagi was playing the, the, that one hour footage of Illuvium that dropped while Wagner was talking. And in my head, I'm like, why are you playing the Luvium's game uh, video while Wagner is talking when you should play something of Star Atlas? So I thought that was pretty funny. And then he did switch it um, after that. But yeah, I guess what we can take out of this, first and foremost, is that Kagi needs a father. So anyone's willing to adopt him, um, you know, <laughs> re reach out to him. He needs some help, uh, some guidance in some of some areas. But love you, Kagi. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think... That was a perfect spot, like Fancy, you're saying, for, for to bring it home with the essay with the Star Atlas points um, and to really put, um, I guess, Karen to sleep, with the, in, for lack of a better word, because uh, th at that point, there was a lot of talk about Star Atlas in, in a negative light from Karen's point of view. And then this was like, yeah, we, find, we got we got things for you to show. And But yeah, the moderator. Yeah, like... Don't get me wrong, I don't think there's a single person here or listening that wouldn't want to have more things to see from Star Atlas, obviously. But you can't use that as a stick to beat somebody with unless you see it and it's bad. Because it's just hearsay at that point, it's speculation, right? And he should know better than anybody as a major player in a huge project that working off speculation, it never works. It always comes back to bite you in the ass eventually. And that, like I say, I wish they'd shown the video more. I think that would have given him a little bit more context to what he's talking about. And, you know, on the on the reverse side, maybe this will instigate us getting a little bit more gameplay from Michael and the team. I'd like to see that for sure. But I'm not going to bash him until I see it. You want to make a yeah, I, decision, right? Absolutely. And I, I swear, this is just intuition, but we're, we're getting this footage of the, the flight simulation of uh, gameplay, if you want to call it that, um, right before the interview the, this debate or interview if you want to call it so on some level you know thank you kagi for kind of throwing yourself out there to to maybe put more fuel to the fire of what was being said between you know uh wagner and and karen to to get this because there was really nothing to really show to real uh, to, to to show i guess karen or the community and any people who are new and interested about star atlas or maybe might have heard of them before to, to go on or to go off of, other than the, the still shots of the Stel Stellaris top-down type of um, gameplay that we're all going to be taking part in with Scream. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think we got that clip and that footage because of this debate, not because of the community and how hard we were pushing to see something, which that could be something we, we work on as a community. You know, like it doesn't have to come from a negative standpoint, but it could be like, hey, I think we're, we're going to deserve it of some more footage in some area of the game uh if we're able to get to get it but um yeah ask you why you have gone so hard on your ui your ui is like 20 times further yeah. ahead than your yep. gameplay 
And my thing is, if you look at my overworld, the yeah. UI is a piece of shit, right? Sorry, Florian, if you're, if you're listening. And it's because we're using basic shitty elements because they don't matter. What matters is movement. It's things like dynamic, actual, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the point of this is that we don't take your approach because we do want to build AAA. And so it means that all of these components that go into the foundation of what we're building require expert detail and attention uh, to precise detail in how we build. And so these content production pipelines are the fundamental component of all of that. And until we get those done, we're not going to roll stuff out. Now, you might have identified the UI component, but if you were actually walking around in that showroom, what you would see is that the cracks in the concrete are real and they're modeled and they're not a texture. What you would see is the transition materials are customized specifically to us. That the locomotion engine that we use, well, Lyra is the base locomotion engine in Unreal Engine 5, has been customized to our characters. The things like physics of ships and movement and sway and camera, those have been customized to us. Now, you might but not where see- are we seeing that? You're not seeing it. That's the entire point. We're, you see it? If, if we, you, if, I'm saying people way, like me, proper, like people like me who are building games, right? People in mainstream are saying your movement of your character is janky as fuck, right? Instead of fixing that, you're we are. you well. Uh, but what I'm saying is, like, this is what UI we're working. First, your UI first approach is it's to not tell UI people. first. This that's what you okay. just because that's what you notice. I, what I'm telling you is what we're working on right now, which is why like building an environment like this for us is critical for our long-term success because once we get these things dialed in, once we get character motion and movement improved and, and smooth and seamless, well, then we obviously get to reutilize that technology throughout the rest of the game, right? So people think about the showroom as being this digital environment, but we're building the, we're creating the building blocks right now that we can then reuse uh, going into the future. So you might've- Yeah, great point, so And uh, I think, um... Wagler really nailed this interview, especially as he uh, got more into it at the end. Yeah, like yeah, there's did. a lot to unpack with that. I'll start by saying I really don't have a lot of time for the comment about the UI. Attacking somebody for having standards and professionalism and wanting the product to look good is total nonsense, right? And ultimately, people that are coming to look at the product that are new, having a UI that is slick and looks good and feels good will only do people a favor. There's no point having it look bad because that's apparently the process, right? If they want to make their product look good, more power to them. It's definitely not a stick to beat them with. Poor form. Yeah, there's also a key difference there, right? Because um, I don't see uh, any point or reasonable point where you have to interact with a lot of different menus, plates or whatever in Illuvium, whereas Star Atlas being on uh, different ships, different planets, different buildings, different whatever, it's going to require a lot of interactions, just like we see with, for instance, Star Citizens as well. There's a ton of different interactions you have to do. There's a ton of different menus you have to open up and uh, interact with. So getting that feeling right, because it's ultimately a hidden main part of the game, interactions via menus and stuff like that, yeah, I find it very um, important to get that going great and movement for instance like i i play a lot of uh, escape from tarkov as well like three or four patches ago we didn't even have inertia then they uh, implemented inertia don't know if everyone is uh, up to speed with what inertia is but it's basically like uh, real physical movement like if you don't have inertia if you go left you immediately go left and you can immediately go right as well like in escape from tarkov uh, before inertia there was this quick peak action where you could just like lean in quickly in and out and with inertia it would uh, require you to lean in and then you would lean out as well like how you do in in with normal human physics so that's also a difference that they made and on top of that after uh, that patch uh, like just the patch they just released they even improved the running model and how uh, some of the characters interact with some different kinds of stuff like guns and stuff like that so Perfecting your movement in the beginning of the game, nice, good, but I don't see it as a main thing that you need to perfect, like, right out of the gateway. It can be perfected over time. 
Yeah, and maybe it's just a matter that the, the UI guy finish their work first, and like so that's the first thing we get to see, and like that doesn't mean it's it was like the priority or like the I don't know like maybe it's just just matter just of that. Look, when when you see gameplay uh, or like snapshots or sneak peeks being posted of various different games being built in Unity and uh, UE5, you often see that those characters are moving like with the speed of light over the ground floor. That's mm -hmm. just a key factor that movement, it's just basic movement from the game engine itself. It's not refined, it's not in tune with what uh, the game developers would like uh, it to be or to look like. So, Yeah, that, that, see that's the kind of thing that kind of lowered the tone of the whole uh, debate or interview, right? Is the fact that I think Winston's kind of hit it on the head there. Like he said uh, sorry to his UI designer or engineer saying, oh, no, it's bad, right? Sorry for saying that, blah, blah, Florian or whatever. The U the guys that are working on that are not going to be the guys that are developing other aspects of the game. It's, a, it's not a matter of prioritization or organization, right? It's just a department has probably hit their targets, right? And another team working on something else is still doing that. It's a really strange attitude to development. Yeah, and and that is, I, I would say, by and large, just again, I'm I'm very interactive with the community, and that like I think people do understand this, right? Um, and we've been very consistent in our communication. Now, have we missed timelines? Have I overestimated? Sure, sure. I it, like fault me for that if you'd like. Uh, we are ambitious, and we'd like to hit certain goals and certain targets, and maybe we we underperform at times. But that's not for lack of trying. It's because we operate in an incredibly complex space. To your point, not only is it very innovative and difficult to build a AAA quality game, but couple that with the fact that we're building all of this on-chain logic, that we're building multiple smart contracts to interact with the game, with the game economy, with the game logic itself. Right, layer that into infrastructure uh, and architectural development of tools that are necessary so that you can play seamlessly with crypto in Unreal Engine. Like these are all challenging things. Now, the way that we develop our development methodology is again clear and consistent communications and what's what our uh, objectives are and best estimates for timelines. We've always said, by the way, these are projections. There's no guarantee that we hit these dates. We're not promising we hit these dates. We think. We can do it in this time, but it's very possible and probabilistic that we will miss timelines, especially from time to time. Um, however, where we, how we develop this out, where we provide consistent value is first and foremost, hey, uh, we launched Faction Fleet. This is a place where you can utilize those ship NFTs and start earning today. Play to earn economy is activated now. People are making that's, Atlas again, today. Once again, that's, the, that's your browser game that is not your MMO and not what people thought they were buying the NFTs for. But anyway. No, it's, that, preci it's precisely well, what, what people believe to be. They're happy with the fact that they're deriving utility from their NFTs today. Um, and we I, also have the sure next. Which, like People are incredibly excited about our browser-based game as well because we have a release of that um, that should be coming this year. Operative work should be coming this year. And I'll, I'll, I'll just qualify it again. But that should be coming this year. And it's also immersive and it's 3D and it's territory control. And it's the next step, right? But we've always said, by the way, I've been consistent. This is five to seven years. Three years would be the most optimistic I could ever be about delivering game, and it would require a lot of things uh, to be favorable to us, including generating a lot of revenue and us being able to scale a team rapidly enough to deliver on all these things. But ultimately, five to seven years has always been my messaging to the community. But it Yeah, that was a great little clip there. He uh, went in. What do you guys think? About the... I guess the browser game, which is like, as they say in the comment, like really it's just taking, it was supposed to be a little bit more than that in the beginning, you know, like, uh, I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, uh, I guess we do have utility on the NFTs. That's good. At least we get some tokens from it. Uh, yeah. Um, then again, it, it doesn't seem very, uh, it doesn't seem to differentiate like the modular release stuff that they were, have been talking about since the beginning. Like, uh, if they never said they would like give it all in one go. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure on this one. Like, uh, he, yeah, once again, he hasn't done a lot of research on the project as a whole, I think. It's funny then, he, this is uh, the whole score system, like the ship staking but he ultimately also had staking on his alluvium coins 
obviously yeah. available on his own website. So and uh, you can you can do anything with the lens either. Like uh, I know we are supposed to launch like a, a mini game with that too. But yeah, on our uh, yeah, that yeah. might end up coming I haven't talked about that the screen. Mm. Yeah, I think four is kind of this comment pretty much sums up how I feel about it, right? They, they do have utility and how people derive that value if they want to extract it, hold, reinvest in it. It's stuff to be had there. Just because I know it's like something that's later going to be used in the game and stuff, that's fine. But ultimately, people can make those decisions like now or back in like Christmas time or whenever, right? It's, it's a strange angle. I don't really understand the criticism. Yeah, this is a nice comment by Gris. The next era yeah. will be key. The showroom will dovetail with screen. People grow to live their sh live their ships around the play. Sorry, <laughs> uh, in the showroom, this love and feel for the ship will translate to top-down game. Yeah, I've said I've stated that also a few times before. Like when you get to load up and spawn in your own ship, like the stuff you bought on 2D paper form, to say so, and then suddenly it becomes 3D and standing in front of you, whilst you may or may not be able to interact with it, it would uh, strengthen the connection with your ships or your purchases uh, very, very much. So it will be a, a very key pivot right there. And it will also be the very first time we see something from the 3D development team going live, which will also add to the conviction we all have that Star Atlas is really capable of delivering the 3D experience we want it to be. Yeah, uh, I'm invested in both and I'm looking forward to Scream more than Alluvium Zero because uh, they're both doing a lot of the same things. It's like a simplified prequel to the main game, I guess. And yeah, it's both compatible on phone, I believe. So yeah, well, I guess it's, just, it's all going to come down to what happens over the next couple of years and uh, who wins, I guess, because uh, there's going to be a lot of people and names we don't recognize yeah, uh, by the end of this, who have just uh, yeah. drifted away or been bought out and uh, changed names, or yeah, yeah. And as uh, Gris said in the in the comments, like uh, referring to Star Citizen, uh, even if we just have like a, a showroom where you can see your ship in uh, 3D, that's uh, a really big thing. Because I remember I was there back then. Uh, I, I joined Star Citizen in 2013 or something, and people were doing live streams, like two hours, three hours, like just showing the ships and talking about, oh, so this is uh, this ship from this manufacturer and uh, going into all the little details and you could actually show it on stream and like uh, go inside the ship and interact with it, open some doors, like uh, just uh, get into the pilot. It, you couldn't even fly them or anything. But that was enough for people to like, uh, I guess, speculate about the game, uh, have a, a visual support to talk about stuff, you know, about the game. And uh, yeah, that definitely sold uh, a lot of ships over the years and until we got some actual playable content. So I think for Star Atlas, it's going to do pretty much the same thing because they're going from the same model, everything. I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this last clip I have here, it's uh, a good conclusion. I think Wagner might have accepted no, I mean, Kieran might have accepted the care of uh, collaboration uh, if Wagner didn't uh, have like the coin dig just before he offered it. So, yeah, <laughs> it'll be funny to see what happens. I tell you what, I, I tell you what, if you could pull it off with your where your token price is now, not financial advice. But every investor is going to be a very, very rich man. But yeah, I, I obviously well, well, I, just, I have uh, my just reservations on, and doubts. Yeah, we did look into that as well. And for what it's worth, we outperformed you guys. Not that I want to get into any anything token speculation related, but uh, especially with your guys' uh, vesting starting to unlock now in June. But um, with that, with that being said, honestly, uh, I think this is a healthy exercise. Um, you know, Kieran, whatever uh, you know however controversial it was that we came here uh, i do respect you as, as a ceo as a founder as a builder knowing that you're an entrepreneur um i, I do want to 
extent, you know, no hard feelings from my standpoint. I'm glad we had the conversation. I do want to extend an offer for us to collaborate at some point in the future if there's any interest. Again, I wasn't trying to diminish you guys with the, the mini game concept. We have this idea of tangential worlds, but it's interconnected metaverse entry points. And so if there's any way that our players can interact with one another and there is interoperability, I'm totally open to that. That is what we are building in Web 3.4, is this idea of interoperability. So um, extend an olive branch to you and, and uh, we'll, we'll totally so, be open yeah, to I it. mean, I, t I tell you what, if, if you guys can, what, like once you get the game plan, because we can't partner up with, with someone that we are doubtful that they can deliver, right? Because then we're going to be screwed as well. We don't want our, our brand tainted by partnerships like that. And, uh, and so, when you get to the stage where you've got actual gameplay and my game devs who have been building games for 15, 20 years go, okay, I actually think that this can be delivered, then 100% will happily yeah. jump on board. But this is all, like this is not a personal attack against you or anything like that. It, I would be doing this with anyone that had pulled in as, as many players or potential players as, as you guys have that I'm concerned about, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's nothing personal. So yeah, if, yeah. if we do get to that stage and maybe you say, screw you, you should have partnered with us two years ago. Now we're here. Maybe that happens, but yeah, I'm, I'm about protecting uh, our investors in our community. Now. It's a great little clip there. And uh, yeah, I think it is quite interesting. He had like a big opportunity to dispute that uh, Star Atlas is outperforming ILB, and he didn't. So yeah, I know there was more like beef after this video on Twitter. Again, yeah. I think I think it's just an example. It's not very well thought out. Again, is it? Uh, I, again, and I think to be fair to Kagi, he could have probably done a better job moderating that bit because it was getting a little bit tit for tat at that point, and it's not a very constructive discussion, as entertaining as it was. But yeah. The partnership thing, I think it's a shame to have that mentality, really, right? Of course, you don't want to be associated with brands and sorts, but it's, you know, it could have been a nice way to end the discussion, right? And yeah, just, just shake hands and say, yeah, sure, we'll do something, right? But, but no, uh, looks like we'll be waiting for that grand partnership. But I, for one, would very, very, very much like to see it, whether that's a, a, a rip-off minigame from Star Atlas or an official partnership, I'd love to see it. Yeah, I think, you know, Karen starts off with, we don't want to partner with projects who doubt what they're creating and how long it'll take. It's just like, like who's doubting when everyone's on that road stacking bricks to build the, the house ultimately? And um, I don't necessarily feel any doubt on part of uh, S S Michael Wagner in at any point in the in the video um, or in the, in the, um, the interview. <laughs> and I, I think that there's a lot of pushback from Karen because there's there's a place where Alluvium wants to be in his eyes or needs to be and that they're not uh, for why he acts and says things in such a manner but but again uh, all speculative and yeah he could have got came back and really went down the rabbit hole with tokens and I, and I we mentioned this on the backstage but there's so many co topics that weren't talked about and even here it was like you know we could talk about the white paper and the, the econ paper and all the tokens and and what you're going to be able to do, everything on chain, what's on chain, what's not on chain. You know, wh what about the chains that these games are living on? One is Ethereum, the EVM chain, and the other is Solana. There wasn't really any talk about the actual networks that these games are going to be running on. Because if Karen, you know, was maybe thinking not so one dimensional, he might have said, hey, Solana might not even be around. Now, I don't know how much he knows about individual networks, but there's a lot of, you know, crap talking about Solana as there are some with EVM with the high gas fees and. But, you know, although the merge is coming with the EVM chain, you know, Solana has hiccups as far as being active and then shutting down. So I would have been you know, interested in seeing what their thoughts are and how much they would have known on the actual chain that they're building on. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, we were supposed to have some uh, questions for Winston at the beginning, but uh, we have so much content that it just completely whizzed by me. So uh, we're excited, huh? Yeah, I did. So, uh, Winston, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, how you came to Star Atlas in Rome, and uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, hi, guys. <laughs> uh, so, I came uh, in Star Atlas around, uh, I guess, uh, August last year. 
So I completely missed like the rebirth event. Uh, and uh, I just came actually like the very last day after you could register for the IDO. So completely, completely missed that. Uh, happened to be there for uh, the first uh, GAO. And uh, I guess for the first month or so, I wasn't so interested in the game. Like I, I was looking at a lot of uh, NFT gaming projects in the play to earn uh, sphere. And uh, OK, so I look at Star Atlas. And honestly, I, I, I was just looking to like maybe buy a ship or two and like flip. And I am like, OK, this is exactly like Star Citizen. So even if they don't make the game in the end, like it's, it's going to be big anyway, <laughs> because people love, love it, you know? Uh, and the more I actually get into the game, you know, hang out in the Discord, talk to the people, uh, also see the words from the, the team and everything, like, I'm like, okay, this, this, this might actually, like, uh, be uh, one of the best uh, projects in the play to earn games in general. So, yeah, I spent about a month just uh, checking things out. And uh, in September, I, uh, I, I'm like, okay, so I'm spending a lot of time in Discord. I'm, I'm starting to talk to people, uh, especially in the French community, like uh, Morpheus, like Darwin, uh, people like that. And uh, I'm like, okay, maybe I should get into a guild. And uh, I was uh, learning a lot about the game through the Metaverse podcast, I think, like many of our members in Rome. So uh, I'm like, okay, maybe I should join these guys. They, they seem like they know what they're doing, so <laughs> I should join. So uh, I ended up, uh, yeah, signing up. and. Uh, here I am. What, what, what is it like? Uh, yeah, one year later, actually, almost. Soon my Roman birthday, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time now. Happy yeah. birthday! Cool. Happy birthday! <laughs> get a nice Aquila yeah, in your it, helm. All right. <laughs> you know, it, it's been a pleasure having you and with everything that you've done and how active you've been, um, especially with the contributing to the Copa. Um, uh, and that whole process with the lore, you, can you talk on that and your experience and what, what, I guess, prompted you to be inspired to write such a lengthy uh, lore that helped us um, along with uh, what we added to the, for that section yeah. of, the, of the COPA, for the COPA submission? Uh, yeah, well, I guess I, I wanted to participate in the COPA thing because uh, I had been in the guild for a long time and, uh, yeah, I wanted to, 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 you know, put my break uh, in the in the common common work we were doing for this event. Uh, so I, I always like to write uh, like some, I guess, some role play stuff uh, for the games I participate in, because I'm, I'm a big MMO player uh, ever since uh, like Dark Age of Camelot. And uh, but really my big first uh, MMO game, it was Star Wars Galaxies. And I don't know if you guys ever played that game, like it was heavy on the role play, like uh, I always had guilds with like different teams, like some people were playing like the Imperials, the Rebels, like the Pirates, everything, and like just a lot of uh, stories that happened in this game. Uh, so I guess that's where I started uh, writing uh, like uh, fan fiction, stuff like that. And of course, big Star Wars fan, so like very inspired on, on this one. And uh, I never really stopped, I guess. Uh, and uh, in Star Atlas, I guess I was, uh, OK, so first of all, to be completely honest, when I first joined Rome, I joined because I think you guys are really uh, like uh, cool on the, um, I guess, gameplay side of things. But the Roman theme, I wasn't really sure at first. I'm like, OK, like this is a science fiction game. It's like a <laughs> ancient Roman kind of stuff. Like, how do you fit that in, you know? And uh, then I started thinking, like, okay, but you remember that show, like, uh, Ancient Aliens? And, like, we were talking about that on the Discord, too. Like, uh, you could have, like, uh, ancient astronaut theory and, like, mix the two together and make something out of it, you know, and have fun with it. So uh, I guess I just went off from that and, like, the different ideas we wrote in the, in the Discord. And, uh, yeah, I just started uh, going uh, a bit wild with it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, awesome. it really. Yeah, I was going to say any, it, uh, messages you want to send to uh, the French community out there. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to be watching this. Oh, maybe some of them, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, bah, oui, uh, salut à tous. Uh, si vous regardez ça, uh, merci d'être là. Hein, C'est sympa. Et puis, uh, bah, on se retrouve uh, sur uh, Star Atlas Trogis et puis sur uh, 
le Discord de la communauté francophone. Hein, vous pouvez nous rejoindre sur euh, donc, euh, le, le chat euh, francophone euh, de Star Atlas officiel. Et dans le, euh, vous pouvez nous rejoindre après sur notre Discord euh, dans les, les messages euh, affichés euh, en haut à droite euh, du Discord. Voilà. Awesome. Very nice. But yeah, I just want to um, reiterate. Uh, thank you so much, Winston. You really contributed a lot of uh, value towards the with that with that lore. It was phenomenal. And if anyone's interested in actually reading what he wrote, you can check it out on our website. I think Fancy had it up. Uh, please might be do. Worth, please do. Yeah. it's an amazing piece, guys. Please do. Really do. Uh, yeah, really if if it. not for anything else and not needing or wanting to join Rome, it's just a great read overall, uh, which it incorporates the lore of Sir Atlas and then. Uh, the created lore uh, out of his fantastic mind and imagination uh, and combining the two so we appreciate yeah. that well thank you guys yes. I'm going to blush now <laughs> <laughs> this week there was a, another hologram report and uh, it's quite an interesting one analysis on how to state or how long to state for this or, sorry uh, a lot of it is uh, stating what we already know uh, the link is up on the screen right now we're gonna go to the assumptions because I find that is uh, the most interesting part and uh, I'll ask one of you guys to tag in when I get tired so assumptions what now follows are some loose assumptions that can be made regarding what a policy holder can expect for daily emissions According to a recent community poll out of 104 respondents, the majority of policyholders plan to or already have staked their polis for a period of greater than three years. These holders will receive six, eight, or ten times the player of the polis voting power compared to a six month staker with the same amount of polis tokens. It is important to resemble that an individual's emissions are determined by a weighted average of the communal P polis voting power. I'm going to always get that one mixed up. What we can assume is that a bulk of the daily policy emissions will go to holders who have now longer stakes since their policy and policy voting power is weighted more favorably by the emissions calculator. Taking the .00658 figure from above, an individual can then make some assumptions regarding their true policy weighted daily emission rate. Does someone want to tag in? Yeah, I just want to say yeah. that they missed an opportunity to make it 0. 0.00426. <laughs> they did, yeah. Mm. So, how long are you guys taking? I am all, on, all in on one yeah. thing. Or... And there's a lot of options. We can uh, skim this, I guess. So, well, I my, I was on mute. I was gonna. I was actually reading. Um, oh, okay. While I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for, for example, if a person has staked 5,000 polis, they can expect a non-weighted baseline return of 32 polis per day. This is not the final figure. By then, factoring in their duration of stake, a person can roughly estimate their likely true daily return of Atlas. If a person has a five-year lock, then they will likely see returns above that non-weighted figure. If a person has a less than three-year lock, or even a sub one year lock, expect that non-weighted daily return to decrease. While a daily return of 32 polis from 5,000 polis staked sounds fantastic, expect any number of polis emissions to drop over the next year as more polis is locked, thus dispersing the distributed polis. Um, should the polis locker reach a 50% capacity of total circulating supply, which is 5,000 polis, uh, or I'm sorry, Circulating supply, 5,000 polis, would yield around single-digit polis per day. Uh, so then we go on to a two-week to a two week or five-year, a tale of two perspectives. There are many pros and cons to the answers of how long to stake polis, uh, many of which can only be addressed at an individual level. In a broad sense, the two ends of the polis spectrum can be broken down into two distinct camps, uh, thought camps. So we have the short term, two weeks to one year. Uh, ignoring non-participation in the polis locker, a short term lock clearly represents the least amount of possible emissions out of all the available options. Uh, uh, proponents of shorter locks 
argue that the volatility and rapid bull slash bear cycles of the crypto market make a long term lock unappealing. Should the market enter a bull market within the next year, any opportunity to capitalize on locked polis would be lost. And short term lockers uh, lockers also argue that the Star Atlas DAO is at least one year or more from any impact impactful proposal that the PVP for proposal voting can still be obtained uh, at the later date at a later date. Lastly, short term advocates point to overall low emission incentives as a reason for not staking longer. And then jumping to the long term three to five years, long term stakers arguably arguably have a greater conviction conviction regarding the Star Atlas DAO for a number of reasons. Many long term proponents argue that if a person truly believes in the long term vision of Star Atlas, then there is no other logical choice. Long term holders also receive more daily polis emissions compared to token holders with smaller or greater amounts of polis who staked for a lesser period. Long term stakers are also likely uh, seeking to maximize their PFP at every level of the Star Atlas DAO. That means capitalizing on every opportunity to acquire more polis. In the long run, having influence over the Star Atlas DAO may, pro may prove to be a more beneficial, uh, prove to be more beneficial than a short term monetary position, or then, I guess, than a short term monetary position. Yeah. Uh, should I take back over? So midterm, yep. one to three years, uh, as a middle ground, there is currently less vocal support for a blended option. Polis holders appear to want to maximize their strategy at either end of the spectrum. However, a case can be made for a mixed approach. Beginning at one year, polis stakers do receive a 2x multiplier to their PVP up to 6x at three years. If one believes both that bulk cycle is more likely in the next year but wish to retain some level of liquidity in a in a time frame less than five years the middle of the range choice may be an attractive one uh so thank you to uh the hologram very nice uh, Shout out. report i recommend reading the whole thing if you uh haven't had a proper chance to look at polish yet but i know a lot of people in our guild have already dug deep into it and uh that's what we're all about yeah, I guess we can, if you want, touch on, I guess, as an individual or the organization you're a part of here. Uh, well, if it's only you guys, but did you guys already stake and for how long and for maybe for what reasons? Uh, I, Brad personally, and Tukun. I personally don't hold. I, I think I hold like 50 polis or something like that. It's like a really, really small amount, but... We, we've talked about this on another podcast before. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's somewhat difficult to advise or to say if you should stake or not, because it all implies on financial status of yourself, of course, right? Locking yeah. up your tokens, especially for this long of durations, um, does bring in some several risks that other people might be clouded from by seeing these um, 10x or 5x or 6x uh, their polis uh, tokens being doubled in price uh, in volume but that doesn't imply that they will double in price as well so there's always this risk of price depreciation or appreciation in the better case on top of that there's always a point uh, for discussion based on the vesting uh, schedules of the team's locked polices and when they would like to sell those of course right um is that on specific dates is that a monthly basis is that a weekly basis even a day-to-day -day basis is possible so it all depends and it all boils down to your personal preferences and how long and how far you're willing to go with your polis of course so i believe that um i can only speak for myself i would potentially like those 50 polis won't make a big difference for me right so i'll probably just eat them in the 10 years to see what mm -hmm. happens um but for for mma in a whole i don't believe that i'm first of all i'm not part of the treasury team so i'm not really like positioned to have any comment based on on all of this and secondly um i even don't know how much polis there is on our balance sheet so right <laughs> i'm just here for gaming operations that's all I guess I'll just touch on what I'm going to do, and I might get called a heretic for this. I was always going to uh, wait for the first two weeks and watch what happens. That's the shortest lockup period. Uh, I was always going to wait till August 15th, 16th, so I can kind of make a, a more informed decision for my personal stuff about people's behaviors and stuff, right? 
I, I wanted to see how many people are going in for two. You know, I just wanted to have an actual sample. I don't like going into stuff blind. I'm a bit of a, a coward like that. I kind of like to, especially on a personal level, what I have, I'd like to probably go in for the maximum amount because I envision myself being involved for that amount of time. And it's, you know, yeah, it's more about the voting power on a personal level to me. But like Tilquin said, it's hardly the same scope as MMA as a business. But I just kind of wanted to see how, A, the price and B, the community reacts to this before I do it. Um, but, but that's just, again, that's just my decision to kind of take it a little bit slower and watch. Uh, so right now, probably August 15th, 16th, I'll probably go full in with my amount because I believe in the project. But I'd just like to watch for a second first, you know? Yeah. Great answers, and I, I think it all really comes down to the individual and their finances first and foremost, and what their ultimate plan was. No matter who you are and what guild you're a part of, you're all for the cause of that guild if you align, you know, uh, with them. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, if you're gonna have to, like, we would never tell anyone in our guild to uh, that there's a mandatory lockup period for us to right. be, you know, successful because there's so much still unknown, even just what you're getting back for locking up. Um, and, and what that looks like. So, but again, if you are a long-term financially savvy or secured person, then, you know, whatever you would do in the guild that you're part of would go a long way as far as helping that guild um, and uh, accumulating more, more polis for, you know, those, um, that PVP and then ultimately the control of a certain, certain uh, area and what you'd be able to, to do and dictate. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's interesting. I have a good amount of polis uh, as I'm, you know, more heavily invested as an individual uh, into Rome. I mean, and well, in, into Rome and Star Atlas assets. But uh, I think I'll wait a little bit and then just stagger it um, myself. Um, again, just waiting for more information. Even, even yeah. you know, Wagner himself is waiting and wanting to know more himself, uh, as he said in the Foundation Room, just, I think, the other day. Um, so, yeah, in due time, we'll have more conversations about it. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a tweet released this week. A uh, new ship is coming, and uh, it's a joy to behold and transport. So, uh, yeah, that's an interesting description. Yeah, especially the silhouette. It's uh, quite weird. I think it's a transport, guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wouldn't think. my first guess. Crazy guess, crazy guess. Crazy uh, guess. <laughs> No, I'm a sucker for that kind of. I like the look of it. Yeah, it's a god. Do you believe it is the uh, Greek uh, Sun Pa? Uh, yep. Large yeah. freighter. So, especially with the two emoticons used, like after the message, it's a sun. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They definitely said like um, reminiscing of uh, the source of light. So yeah, sun, sun Pa. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Read between the lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a smaller one, to be honest. It, well, but just because it's so weirdly shaped, but I guess all the Greek is are. So since it's a uh, large, I guess it'd be at like the top of the price range for this bracket. So around the nine mark, perhaps less, because uh, I don't know its rarity yet. And that uh, does have uh, some consideration. Yeah, I, I was I was just thinking too, um... If there was any Oni guilds uh, that are specifically search, rescue, and I guess medical, if you want to like throw that in there, um, I, I you know I don't know any specific Oni faction guild. If there is if there is even one of them just for that, uh, and if there is out there if there is one out there, you know, just reach out because uh, there's a lot of I was and why I say this is because there's a lot of assets that were purchased maybe before the repricing, and I was I'm curious to know did anyone here pick up any uh, specific chip ships uh, before the repricing, <laughs> and and what and what ship if you want to share? I just I just share. bought I just bought a few extras. I bought a few two for face extras and a, a few mix extra nice. because they were like pretty damn cheap and uh, I couldn't resist. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Mm, I, th I, th I, I actually picked up a uh, an arc and uh, some search and rescue um, ships. So like the med tech and then the evac, um, just because I was not having enough in that in that area for diversification purposes. Yeah, I just yeah. Got, um, stuck stuck to fighters because that's my personal fleet, and since we as MMA hold a substantial fleet, 
um, I would get to cherry pick from that fleet as well. So that's uh, that's that. It's just personal nice. preferences on some ship models that I liked. Yeah, so I did get some uh, um, Breath of Life. Breath of Life is that the name? The Busan one, the stealth ships. I've got a few okay. of these. Yeah, I, because I, I really like them, and I'm like, okay, do, do we get them at these prices again or not? Mm, I don't know. So I, I picked up a few, yeah. Because I, I didn't have like many uh, any Busan ship actually. So uh, yeah, since we're only, I'm like, okay, I, I maybe I want like a few, just a few stealth specialized ship for scouting stuff like that might be useful nice yeah, that's so another more... topic, uh, we often have in mma as well is like why is there literally almost no busan uh, ship available on the marketplace and since everything has gone down so much is it logical to sell those ships from one of the three main factions in the last spot at full retail mm. price hmm. so it's just a topic just keep it in mind might be a fun one for a next stop uh, a next episode or something like that yeah uh, we awesome. just passed that two hour mark and uh yeah we do have a bit more to uh show today so let's uh dig into it lumina he sent me some more things from coexist i made this in uh uh Unreal Engine Five. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. Really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's really crazy it's... what they do over there. Uh, yeah, and how lazy, fast they do yeah. it. <laughs> Is this what uh, I'll look forward to on my tree arrow, with a, a background of, of something like that? Yeah, uh, this might be on a tree arrow actually. Yeah, you don't know. In yeah. time. And uh, they also created a headquarters where uh, there could be meetings, but uh, I'm not sure if I've uh, seen these in the Galactic Asset Offerings yet, so... <laughs> <laughs> they were a gift from Elon. Yeah, uh, right. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's very awesome. Yeah, shout out to Coexist. Awesome always work. a lot of love in the comments. For yeah. sure. Lumina, always omnipresent gotta love the guy it's amazing this is uh one last thing we have to show is uh some of their skins they made for px4 and uh yeah it looks cool this uh prompted a response from wagner to talk about uh the custom uh skin editor that'll be coming and uh i think it's really awesome i like this one especially but uh People might see you coming from quite far away. Yeah, but since it's just a, like a personal cruiser, it could be a little bit vi more vibrant, right? So sure. yeah. So the skin customization that eventually rolls out. Looking forward to that. Yeah, that's yeah. gonna be amazing, man. There's a. I love skins to play there. A lot of new pitches have been released recently as well. These are all uh, boosters, so lacking in the only department right now. But <laughs> yeah, I guess you'd be able to tell their roosters by their feet, even though sometimes they do look quite alien. Yeah. Well, yeah, because the photo, the photo you guys, they also have like uh, tiny feet, you know, mm. the same way, a little bit. That's true. Yeah. I like this gold one. Uh, it's quite weird how mm. slim their chest is. It's like they don't have uh, ribs or. <laughs> yeah, they're robots. They don't need to have like yeah. intestines and stuff like that. So. <laughs> yeah. They look cool. They look very good. Yeah, they're aesthetically pleasing, for sure. Yeah, lots of variety too. Let's mm. get that community creation off. These are legit. I'd love to see some of these in motion. You know. Um, for what it's worth. Yeah, I'm sure, they, around. I'm sure they have like a ton of that, but they're just uh, not really the type to show anything this early. It's just at uh, the tip of the iceberg and Alluvium, they should just show everything since they have it. So everybody's up to date all the time, but Star Atlas has loads of ammo just in reserve, especially if someone challenges them to a debate. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you still, you still got to remember that they have to fill a gap of like, what, three to five years? 
So they have a long way to continuously keep us engaged with what they mm -hmm. release, right? Absolutely. But everything we've seen so far, it's amazing stuff. Like, either it be from Star Atlas themselves or things we see from Coexist. So. Yeah, uh, they're definitely keeping us engaged. But if this is like part of the custom skin, then <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool to make some Roman ones. I wonder what how they roll that out. If it'll be open to everyone, or if uh, like organizations can make a few and then like use that to like make outfits. I think that would be cool. But yeah, a lot much. of people would want what they want to wear. So. Nice. This one in particular looks really nice. His uh, mud faction is tied to Pierce, uh, the Pierce uh, yeah. manufacturers. So this could be like a potential police sort of um, armor. Crusader, Look, Crus Crusader Galactic Industries. Shipping. Yeah. <laughs> Same guys. <laughs> yeah, they're omnipresent. <laughs> it's a, Crusader Industries is also a manufacturer of ships in uh, Star Citizen. Uh oh. That's a, a subliminal message right there. First, the first yeah. Star Citizen. Players. But the the, the mud characters, I think they look a lot better than the first one we saw. Um, I don't know if you remember, like uh, back when we just had like the faction pictures, they showed us a few renders of like a, a human, a Miris, and like a Uster. And the humans kind of look a little bit weird. Like they had the eyes yeah. a little bit. Uh, you, you remember? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. These ones look a lot better, I think. <laughs> They've improved that's, a lot for sure. That's why you outsource them, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, touché, uh, touché. This final picture, it kind of looks um, like a Calico ATS Enforcer without the huge gun coming out of it at the bottom. So I'm not sure. It looks like a bomber or like a stealth fighter or something like that. Very cool. And uh, that wraps up what we have uh, for Star Atlas. So I believe you have some more content for us, Ray, if you want to take that away. Yeah, I guess if there's no comments left on Star Atlas amongst our panel here uh, of guests, then, um, yeah, I think it's it's worth maybe talking about uh, Star uh, Axie Infinity, but then also some other uh, things that I've noticed in games that are, uh, that are uh, in the works and showing some more promise after it's been about a year or so uh, for some that I'm going to be showing here. Uh, but yeah, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen and get that out the way. So Axe Infinity has been doing, oh, here we go. Okay. Thanks for bringing me up. So uh, the summer breeding event has, has, took, has taken place and uh, jump in whenever you have anything to say as far as like, I know MMA, they have scholars and they play Axie Infinity, uh, Origin V3, and the the Lunasian Summer event took place, and it's going to be the length of 50 days right here, uh, over the course of 50 days. And I just thought of mentioning this first because it definitely, as far as the SLP burning, um, which I'll get into Max Brand and his technical skills um, of uh, of charts, <laughs> but uh, all in all, I think it's it's just the beginning and a, the little like a drop in the bucket of what we're going to see coming along as far as the economy uh, being revamped. Uh, so runes and charms are a big component to playing the game and uh, having the advantage over your opponent, which you can equip these to the Axie and the cards. So um, if you haven't ever played the V3 version of the game, it's, I would say, totally different um, compared to v the, the V2 or classic version of the game. And the potential for earnings and the stability of the economies are well on their way, um, in my opinion, from everything that I've experienced uh, for the last year and some change up until now. Um, so it's not live as far as what you'll be able to earn by playing. It's going to come online soon. And the adi the additional sinks uh, are going to become pretty apparent as the, this breeding event is one of those sinks. And these happen periodically. Um, so, yeah, so you can obtain these parts and we could probably talk on I would like to hear your opinions too on the economy as far as like what you yeah. expect uh, coming down the pike with the uh, activation of the burning of SLP to mint and and um, and to create charms or what's required to just create any charms and runes so uh, but pretty much this is what we're looking at as far as 
what body parts uh, and what you'd get for matching up a uh, a watermelon head card v with a Unko head card. And every Axie has six body parts, and each body part has a card associated with it with a, sp with a specific effect, uh, attack, or defense, is shield. And uh, they've chosen these particular body parts to then, if you are to uh, breed them together, you'll, um, you'll have a certain uh, end result. Uh, and there's the, there's the recessive and dominant gene, so it can get pretty detailed, uh, but I'll leave it to you guys who are interested and not to this, uh, get too deep into it. But the breeding event um, is pretty exciting, and there's a lot of people taking part in it. Uh, what do you guys think so far about the breeding event? Um, yeah, so firstly, it was really nice to just see that uptick of people actually participating in breeding in the first place. Um, I think for a long time we were only just seeing pretty much hardcore breeders or the very occasional like odd player, but a lot of people that were doing it had kind of died off, and it was right. nice to see to give people a reason to get back into it. Um, I can say for a fact when we first got one of them, uh, it, it's really cool, man. It's a good way to do it. I was more interested in like the, the overarching principle of seeing this seasonal thing and how they can build on it and use it as like a burn mechanism in the future. Um, it's like, say they do a Halloween thing coming up, right? everybody's going to want to have a spooky exit part on there you know it's just a cool it's a really nice like it's those having those routine sinks will go a long way to stabilize the economy like you were inferring with the charms and stuff and this is just another way to keep things ticking over and keep the engagement high right absolutely yeah um, and and go ahead speaking of like the charms and stuff we had our first last last weekend token right they, we had our first uh, internal axi origin competition and it became yeah. apparent to a lot of our guys who had only been playing for fun up until that point, because obviously there's no earning in it, mm -hmm. uh, how important that stuff's going to be, right? And we saw with a lot of the builds as you go later into the thing, they're really important. And yeah, because they are going to influence the game and they're going to shape how people play. And well, for a start, I love the depth that it provides on a gameplay level. But second to that, the benefit to the economy, and you've pulled it up now, right? Mm -hmm. We're just going to see that SLP burn number tick up and up and up, I hope. And yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, with, with all these, uh, I guess, isolated events that Axie Infinity uh, bring forth for the community to partake in, uh, it doesn't really give the people of old who were a part of the community any confidence because we see these ebbs and flows of these events and how they have a positive impact, but only momentarily on the economy of the tokens um, uh, during the event. And then afterwards, there's a, there's a lull and a low period of just nothing really happening. But again, with the revamp of the game, and everything and the many releases that are taking place and the teams pushing forward i don't see this as the end but ultimately the a very new beginning to a, a more successful economy when it comes to these tokens that we have or associated such a negativity with over the course of um the lifespan of ax infinity so here we have max brand showing the burn rate so minted versus burn versus a 30-day average versus the 14-day average over the past 30 days. So yellow is minted, and we're looking at a graph here for those just listening. And the um, the green underneath are the burned on the day, and then the days are far below. Um, so we have almost and exceeding, the total amount burned is exceeding the amount minted uh, for almost a whole duration up until, you know, today, or when, no, not today. So up until the 29th of this month, um, so that's just a, a great sign because once this breeding event is over, uh, hopefully the the minting, uh, the I guess the minting process and what is required as far as resources, which is SLP and potentially AXS, um, is going to be active and we're going to be seeing a constant burn. And maybe in the beginning it might not be much, but if you really want to be a part of the arena and excel to earn more SLP, uh, which also the SLP rewards will be smaller than they were of V2. So I think they're pulling their levels, their levers as far as Axie Infinity is concerned with what you'll be able to earn from playing and then what you'll have to do to earn more. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Is there a five, is there a five day breeding cycle on Axies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why you see those spikes every five, fifth day. Exactly. You know, there's a big benefit as well to the guys that are like not overly familiar with Axie to the runes and charms. We were kind of talking about earlier about players' journeys, right? Mm -hmm. And like how you experience and interact with the game. The good thing about this is not only will they like, you know, help the economy and stuff, 
previously, if you wanted to change your XE team, you'd have to sell your XEs or buy new ones. This is adding a lot of variation in how you can actually use your teams with your existing assets by being able to like, you know, add extra things, take stuff away and balance. And it, it's good stuff, man. It's yeah. Overall, it, it, it's, it could be a little complicated as even for myself, like there's just multiple avenues to explore with Axie Infinity at this point. Right. The esports scene is just blowing up. There's so much support and growth happening there. That's going to also be a major contributor to why the economy will stabilize and potentially, in my opinion, become the most stable across any of these games that are that are active online as far as like in-game economies are concerned um, because of the competitiveness of just the gamers uh, and the different organizations that are buying and breeding Axie specifically to battle, which then will require runes and charms. And then, you know, it's, it's, if you made an equation, it could be like a, you know, there's a specific equation you could, I guess, solve for why it all makes sense. But um, it, yeah, some people only look at the SLP price and then you can't really be mad at anyone for doing that. And then hearing all of the negativity almost on a coordinated front at this point, similar to what Star Atlas is going through with a lot of content creators comparing it to you know, EVE Online and Star Citizen and whether it's completion or economy, there's just a lot of the word scam and Ponzi going around. Um, and I, I don't think it's just uh, in as, as many ways as people are talking about it because of how early we are. And these projects aren't necessarily going to go anywhere. You know, they're just going to keep iterating and just building. So that's my my two way on the on the matter um yeah, and then those heavy, yeah those heavy words like scam and stuff like that or are those are or have been become too heavily discounted by uh, the communities like people throw these words around every single day without impact uh, thinking on possible impacts they could lead up to so should we touch uh, on that for a second i know it's a bit off the cuff but obviously axie's had a lot of difficulties with stuff in the media over the last uh, few days like five days ago there was an article by time uh, the headline yep. was a crypto game promised to lift filipinos out of poverty here's what happened instead right. i'm sure i'm sure yeah and it, it, <laughs> it's, 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 really? <laughs> yeah it's, they're not it's not the most subtle with hit articles i've read um they're not really they're kind of giving the game away but and yeah they are along with a lot of other builders in this space they're having to put up with these pretty uh, low-hanging attacks from mm -hmm. mainstream media outlets now. Because it's easy to do that, right? You take a guy that was earning X amount of money from playing a game a year ago, and now look at it now. You can go down that route, but but yeah. Yeah, I, I, it definitely feels like it's coordinated uh, in, in many ways, as there's major YouTubers, I think, I forget his name, uh, more real estate entrepreneurial, um, uh, forget his name now, but across two... Uh, two different youtubers there was like total of 3.5 million subscribers and potential viewers uh who would have seen their videos that were promoting axie as a ponzi scheme and and just like with karen talking and be and interviewing wagner there's just a lot of ignorance and not not in a derogatory way but a lot of unknown uh information across the individuals who are saying these types of things um as the space continues to grow every day it's not just axie was this at this point in time and now you know it was a, a lost cause after after the fact so you know so there's so much development taking place on a constant basis and if you keep up with anything star atlas i would equate that speed of development and and um and communication and and building with the community as i would say it's on par with what we see with wagner and star atlas so um just to make that comparison where you know anyone who might have thought of axie in a specific light it definitely isn't the case now uh you know and it might be hard to to think of that if you're just looking in from the outside you know being drowned by all these scam and ponzi scheme type of conversations um but yeah we move on to another whole level or avenue of sinks that are going to be had and the ax the axie infinity builders program so we have uh, across Lunasia, which is a side scroller that's playable as a demo, but there's no burning mechanics of any SLP or AXS uh, yet uh, active for any of these, but for the requirements for any of these to exist and to have funding and helping uh, for development purposes from the team of Sky Mavis and Axie Infinity is so it is that they incorporate the utilization of these tokens, uh, the governance, which is AXS and Small of Potion in some way. And I think it's a detailed way of uh, when they signed up they had to fill out the form but the most recent ones uh the most recent game that was in alpha closed alpha was defenders of lunasia 
Yeah. Uh, so Axie Doll, and there was a, a whole panel of players of of the Sky Mavis team who were participating on a live Twitch stream, and we won't watch the whole thing, but I do have some game uh, footage here that I could show, and what I'll have to do is share my screen with audio. So I'm going to back out here, and just because uh, I didn't do that, but I think it's one of these games that anyone who enjoys would be able to play and not ever do anything outside of that game. You would just need the ticket of entrance, which is an Axie. And it's only one. You wouldn't need a whole team. So I think it's pretty cool that uh, that we have something like that happening in this space with uh, so many assets that are being held and owned. Um, so here we go. So there's no one talking, I don't think, but I'll walk you through it. So you have your... You choose your axi. Say again. And you full screen it. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to move it along, but so basically, you these are the cards that are associated with all the axes and their body parts. So they they they're random here, uh, and there's there's different classes of axes. So bug, plant, reptile, uh, fish, you know, beast, and bird. So you're gonna start playing this game by selecting the card set that you want. And each Axie has a already set um, card set of attacks. So what it's looking like here, just from the closed alpha, is that you can pick the cards you want for the alpha, uh, for the Axie you, you have. And then I'll just fast forward. So you, they all have a different effect. And you would know just off the, the image and the artwork what card and the effect is. Um, so the names populate down below of which ones you're choosing. And on the bottom here, it says charge a powerful attack. And they have the description. Uh, of the card effect and then let's just fast forward here to the actual gameplay so at first it might appeal to some and not not others but it's a very addicting game i haven't even played i just watched as it's a closed alpha and i don't have access yet but you level up by acquiring the gems that you have to go back and retrieve on the map so here we have if you look at the enemies getting attacked on the on the right here if you can follow my cursor there's gems so you pick them up and the more you pick up you level up if you look at the top left part of the screen there's your level bar and then uh, right below the axis is the health bar and all of these animations uh, are the card effects of the axis and the associated you know body part cards so yeah and then you have on the top right the enemies you killed and it's a pretty simple game and the leaderboards are what everyone's trying to climb with surviving as long as possible. Uh, There's a variety of enemies that come around. And every time you level up, you get to choose out of three cards uh, what new ability you can use to help you stay alive the longest. So it's pretty entertaining. And then it, get, it gets pretty ridiculous as far as how many enemies are on the screen that you have to dodge and run through. Uh, so, can you play that like on your phone? Yeah, so it is going to be mobile. It's a browser also. And if you only had one Axie, then I guess that those cards are what you're going to be dealing with, I believe. So, again, I, there isn't like a whole white paper roadmap type of situation going on that I know of. And if I'm wrong, please uh, let me know. Anyone watching this after the fact interested in Axie. But uh, you, you can imagine how it's going to prompt people to check out and learn about other axes and what moves they have and then potentially buying that axie so or breeding a specific axie which require the burning of slp and uh, axs I so think, yeah one of the cool things i found about it is a lot of the moves that are translating into this game they are often at least they seem to have taken an effort to make moves that aren't so well suited to the meta of classical origin they are they could really useful in this so it's actually bringing utility to axes that would probably just be floor axes on the marketplace normally. Right. So there could be a floor axie right now that would shine the, the brightest in this type of a mini game um, that's being helped uh, grow by the builders program. And you would probably be able to earn more playing with that one axie that was floor at the time that you purchased. And then earning more from this mini game, if you want to call it a mini game, than playing in the arena and trying to rank up for the actual Axie Infinity 
you know, Origin V3. Because there's going to be a, a leaderboards for all of these types of mini games, and uh, for you to excel and be the best you you can be, you're going to need to maybe breed a particular axie uh, that has a move set um, that you've identified is the best versus you know, while you trial and error. But all the while, I think you'd be having fun, you know, just trying to beat your own personal record and then also compete on the leaderboards. All the while, the economy is being stimulated. There's more burning of SLP, and the sinks are just becoming uh, starting to get turned online um so yeah i don't know it's, uh, this this is a pretty fun game and and i can, can just imagine people having access to this particular game on their mobile phones will spend yeah. at least five more minutes on every toilet <laughs> do during the day. all right i'll get constipated it just on looks purpose amazing. Just... <laughs> <laughs> it more... just looks fun all right I'm gonna get rid of fiber in my diet so we can play some more of this. So, yeah, I, I, I would implore everyone, anyone interested, maybe just in this game, you don't have to learn everything about Axie Infinity, but if you like these types of games and it's a Web3 game, you could support it. Um, and indirectly, you would support the actual ecosystem of um, and the economy of Axie Infinity by doing so. So, cool. And then uh, I think this is the last thing for Axie Infinity, but this is a the hottest axes in the last 24 hours. So the community does phenomenal things, and they create all these docs and um, you know things that help the community along that the team might not have time or or might care to do because of their priorities. But this is actually an updated doc that's showing the hottest axes that were um, I guess purchased um, on the market and what the the associated body parts are and those cards. So you know. It's always it's always great for the community to be to, to share some type of I information agree, that Dor. helps everyone. I agree. <laughs> Good one. Uh, but here we go onwards. So that's Axie Infinity. Uh, I don't know. Did you want to talk about anything specific, Brad? Um, overall, I think it's just uh, it's looking it's looking great for Axie Infinity. You know, whether you're yeah, invested think, or not. I think yet. you've done a pretty good summary. But the other thing I'll say is that if that game we've just looked at, though. Uh, piques your interest that's not the only game on the builders program there's quite a lot of promising like different there we go got the list here right and like obviously it's a work in progress right now the burn mechanics will come later but there's a pretty good variety right and there's some of them you know i do genuinely see a future where they're going to be bringing utility to a lot of different axes that would normally just be sat there as fodder to get extra energy or left on the marketplace um here's a, yeah let's have a look at this this is just a good example, I think, to show the contrast in the different kinds of projects on the Builders program. Yep, for sure. You know, for every one of those links, there's 12 total being built by different developers uh, who are taken under the wings of Axie Infinity and Sky Mavis. So pick a genre and you'll have your axes basically uh, being able to be played uh, in these in these mini games or these actual okay. games. Yeah, this looks like a combination of Crash Bandicoot and Mario Kart. Yeah, with axes. Yeah. It's pulling on my heartstrings. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! Look at him go. And this is something yeah. I will say that along with say, I, I like Dollar. I mean, this is, I like this. <laughs> like this, yeah. this, this is my is, kind of jam. Yeah, but ultimately, this also inspires and boasts the whole Web three conversation, right? Like Absolutely. somebody made a game that has become big and now people are very much fond of it and they start developing their own mini games with assets from said game because it's possible, because it's Web3, because it's decentralized at some point. So that's just awesome. This right. is it, right? So we like, we always talk about like interoperability and like, you know, Michael touches on like the, the connected universe, but we've gone from a world where you buy an Axie and you can just use it in classic to now in a few months, you'll be able to play doll with it. You'll be able to play like a Mario Kart clone of it. You'll be able to play a Brawl clone of it. And it's really opening up what you can do with that asset, right? And I love it. Yeah. It, and it's just uh, like, like they phrase it themselves, uh, the team of Axie Infinity, it's your ticket to multiple metaverses. Mm -hmm. um, and you're gonna definitely find something that you'll enjoy you know some people don't like the art so they won't even even they won't even get involved in the first place uh with <laughs> with what axie infinity is but again i think of them as still the leaders who trailblazed what everyone else is trying to accomplish and replicate in some way in this space so um 
there's gonna be a whole so, yeah by seeing this i would say they are still they still are like they're still trying to do stuff that everyone is talking about and these guys are actually doing it like we can bash on them for as long as we want but still axie is probably the biggest known game in web3 and seeing them doing this and then their whole community picking this up and creating their own kind of games that's really awe-inspiring absolutely yeah i do have a question though uh okay so they're making these mobile games but how easy is it to onboard people who like don't know anything about crypto or stuff like that into these mobile games for example do you need to buy an axi to get into this or like i guess you can just use it from someone else but how can you just download it from like the google play store and like just get in you know sure so right now with the revamp of the actual game um, not the one that's showing on the screen. This is just one of the builder program games. But if you wanted to play, there's three axes that you can play for free with. So Axie okay. Infinity is basically free to play now. There's no needing to all buy right. or interact with the marketplace at all. You start the story mode, you unlock the characters by progressing in the adventure mode, the PVE, and then you'll you'll get walked through as with a tutorial and a storyline. And it's a full-on story with characters and personalities and, you know, adventure. And once you do that, you complete it and un unlocked. I think you're going to have a, at your disposal four axes to play with. And then you'll be able to partake in um, in the arena. And But the thing is, is you won't be able to earn from playing, although you can play in the arena uh, after you've finished PvE. Uh, you won't be able to earn any rewards once the rewards are online, unless you have one axie off the marketplace that you've purchased so now with every axie that you purchase to 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 make your team of three you'll earn more and more so if you own all of your axes which you'll need three of you'll be earning the most from playing and winning based off of skill play uh in the arena but with that comes a lot of education like anything else in the space right for why you're going to get in in the first place you need to learn what the cards are what maybe the best synergies and um, and then you'll be able to earn. So yeah, on on the onset, they've changed it completely. As before, it was it was hectic. I can uh, I can attest to that as being a, a long term uh, supporter and investor in the game, but also a player. It was just mind numbing. To it took forty eight plus hours, almost a week, to get comfortable enough to just buy the axes. And then when you did buy the axes, they were overpriced because you didn't have your thumb on the pulse of the economy uh, with all the the different types of axes and what they can do and it was it was pretty crazy, but I'm you know you stick it out and now it's much easier of an experience. Yeah, and they did do the back in I would say April May time they did the education uh, competition for Origin, mm -hmm. and I'd like to think that there'll be another education thing to help onboarding new players into the ecosystem when some of this stuff's up and running as well, right? They're pretty good at encouraging community members to get out there and create content to help onboard people, so I'm I'm pretty confident in that. Yeah, great point. Thanks for sharing that. So on the education front, well, besides that, they also have the Lunasian Code uh, program that they that re that they released the referral program. And I mentioned this in a previous episode, but it's been about like two weeks that I've touched Axie. But just to reiterate that they uh, there's leaderboards for that you'll get one percent out of the out of the uh, four point twenty five percent to the creator that you uh, that that you support by using their code. And you can have a custom code and anyone can apply now, but they lean more towards people who are building content around Axie Infinity, whether educational or entertaining. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can always reach out on the main Twitter account. They regularly post that announcement there where you can sign up. But uh, yeah, you know, all, all full steam ahead with Axie Infinity, in my opinion. So if, if nothing else on that, then um, I did want to make note and watch this trailer of treeverse which came out just the other day just yesterday i guess it's been a game in development for a year now uh a little bit over a year and i've been following along we have a combat trailer that we're watching now. Seems like you can co-op with friends. 
What blockchain is this? This is called Treeverse. It's on Solana. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it was very emotionally, uh, it pulled on my heartstrings for sure, and yeah. there was a lot of attention on it. They've been in the background building for a while. Uh, have you guys seen this uh, before? Just this show? Yeah. I mean, the showing. I've uh, I've seen the website and the game launch, uh, or the initial website from the game to say so, and I missed the IDO for the NFTs. Uh, but then, like a week or three ago, I was going over Magic Eden, and I saw it again, and it instantly popped back into my eye. Started looking at it again, so I was kind of surprised to find today that they released this uh, little video. So I'm uh, eager to try it out since it was co-developed by some people who had um, experience within, I believe, Blizzard, Riot, and. Activision, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, was quite the uh, quite a good team as well. See, Horizon Zero Dawn. That's a Dutch studio. Dark Souls Three, Marvel Spider Man. Just scroll over. It's on top of these pictures. Uh, like there, meet the team. Oh, yeah. Here we go. There we go. See, League of Legends, Rainbow Six Siege. Oh. And so, how do the NFTs work in this one? Uh, it's just a character for now. You can buy it. It's oh, about okay. five souls, somewhat around that, as a floor price, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So there's three separate NFTs, and there was a nice thread that I pulled up by this gentleman here. Oh, yeah. So fluorescence, and I could just like speed through it. But it's been over a year, and Luke Fai is the co-founder. Amongst there's another that we just seen, but they have the founders plots. Uh, so it was within the days uh, of when I saw an opportunity to mint land plots for Treeverse, an MMORPG game sl slated to be uh, a modern Web3 runescape. As someone who grew up uh, with that type of experience, he goes on to uh, talking about the collections of the project. And the project collection was preceded with NFT trees. So the original collection of Loop, uh, the 420 pixel style tree with varying traits and varying uh, and variety, which will be also integrated into Treeverse. So the tree owners will yield rare fruit, which can be bought uh, by other players within within game root currency. These fruits offer temporary buffs to character stats, uh, differing, uh, differing depending on the variety of tree. NFT trees are crazy sought after now with a current floor of 15 ETH, which is uh, pretty insane. Uh, I don't know the quantity. I did have uh, it pulled up at one point on uh, OpenSea, but they're just very costly and they never really went down even within this bear market so um the third the third treeverse collection so there's there's nft trees the nft plots and then now the avatars so uh the third uh treeverse collection released was timeless so that's the name of these avatars release and the C the, the cco collection of four thousand nine uh, nine thousand four hundred characters with double, uh, uh, which double as PFPs and in-game avatar skins, sick design created by Vision of uh, V, uh, and interoperable through different worlds. FYI, follow V to track their next project. A uh, little shout out to them for the art and everything. So early adopters of the, of, so yeah, so that's pretty much it. Like you, you see, you can make up uh, in your mind based off of what they're giving you and the trailer and these three different NFTs associated with the project that it's a, uh, they have the runway and I've been following it for a while and I missed out on the mint for land plots. I didn't pick up a tree because it was only trees in the beginning. Um, and it was, you know, they, they built uh, all, all along. And now with this trailer, it's what people really might need to see before they make a move. Um, if that's actually what the gameplay is looking like, then kudos to them. It's something that I would probably enjoy playing. Wait, I'm mixing two things up. This is Treeverse. What's the one called on Solana? That's yeah, I, when you said that, I was, I didn't want to talk in confidence on what. I think it's just gonna stay on e on. Um, yeah, yeah, on, no, no, no. The, there's two separate games, but this one is called Treeverse, and the other one is Everseed. And the way I mixed it uh, up is see. because Treeverse uses that same plant emoji um, right. that Everseed <laughs> use on their website as well. That's why the mixture is there. Gotcha. Yeah, but uh. 
yeah, both projects are actually pretty cool, and they're moving along with uh, great experienced developers. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. And then on a more degeny type of uh, play, which is the most coolest project I think is out there, not financial device. You know, uh, I guess Enjoy also mentioned it. I don't know. Have you guys heard of Aether Jump? Yeah, no. we uh, <laughs> we did a show. Uh, well, we got a show release in overnight tonight that I've uh, done with Enjoy. We're a big awesome. part about Aether Jump. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I love how accessible it is. Um, obviously, sending levels and just being able to click to play. I'll say to anybody out there that's just seeing it now, type it in on Google and just click on it. It takes you straight into a level. You immediately start playing the game. Yeah, so we got start. the website. Just type uh, it in now. You know, well, f okay, okay, hold on. Well, first and foremost, I just wanted to point out how crazy it is that you can play on someone's plot that they didn't develop yet. So this is the generic plot that you start off with. Um, this is my actual Roman, I'll call him. So I did buy a, a medium plot Roman character, and it's a side scroller, but it's a builder. It's a builder side scroller. So closer to what was that? What did you call it? The, the Mario, Mario builder or Super Mario? Mario Maker. Paper, 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 Mario, uh, Mario Maker. There you Maker go. Paper, it's been a while. Uh, so if I had created a, a map, uh, a map to go through, you would be able to test it out, uh, as you can on the website, which we'll jump to. So. Let's just jump here over to the main and go to their website. And the team is young from what I'm learning, but very enthusiastic and smart about how they're they're going about this. But, but aside from that, you can, you can check out your plots if you have any, but you can just play right now. And it's an actual builder. So I think it's the most unique uh, in the space. It's simple, but it's effective. And you'd be amazed how many people, if you didn't know, do personal record speed runs of different maps there's a whole economy and supporting user base for that so we can pull in some enemies here you know they, they vary so we have slime they all have a name associated with them fat bat slime a smart slime and then a regular slime you can choose your character clouds that disappear if you stand on them um you have the, the magma ice falling sand Mud so and... how much room is there like relative to what you're seeing is that everywhere you can place or can you like scroll around from scene to scene exactly so there's different scenes depending on the the size of the of the nft that you bought so uh if you go back to ethereum uh on if you go back to ethers uh either jump on open sea then we have the the sizes and there's only three small medium and large and if you go to the large and you click on one of them if someone actually um built out a map to to go through you would see it here and you'd probably be able to play just from here um it's taking a second but yeah a lot of people are might be speculating still but there's a lot of holders of the community as it's uh it's the mint was only a 0 0.05 and the floor is now at 0.1 or, or higher, depending on the size of the plot. But yeah, you're right. You can build upwards and sideways, depending on how big your plot is. If it's a large, I'm not, I haven't started building myself as I did purchase and uh, I'd, I'd say invest in this, uh, this project. But other than that, uh, yeah, I think it's an amazing project. And once you build it out, anyone could play your map for free. And if you incentivize people to play, then um, you yeah, can charge I, a high price. Pretty much, and you can just you know hire hire people to to build for you if you wanted. Like this, this is a lot you can do. I'm using uh, my keyboard here, which I think oh, it is controller compatible. Just for those who might be thinking and wanting to know, so you can just get creative here. You can erase, you can select, and I think you can zoom out depending on how big the plot is. So this plot, I think, was a, what, what did I click on? Maybe, a, yeah, I think that's a large plot, but you can really run through uh, what it's going to be looking like. And it's pretty cool. So yeah, I just want to... Uh, definitely want to see an update on that next week. For sure, yeah, I'll get some more granule details about it, but this is just like... It's the most fun I've probably had in a while. <laughs> and this is Web3 NFT space. Yeah, and I'll check out MMA's video out on it as well. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool project. We could share that. So, um, 
So I'm going to leave that. And then here is a community made website where you can actually try out peoples um, for free right now without needing to own anything. You can check out their maps that they created. So you have a lot of just people uh, building. I think there was Mega Man. Here we go. The Retro Strider. Or Strider. And then we have Eevee from Pokemon. And these are all maps. So I could probably just jump in to show one. Uh, let's do the Eevee one. Show us your skills, Ray. Come on. Hell no. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Let's play a level. <laughs> so, you know, things are happening in the space that are pretty innovative and just... Maybe this wasn't reinventing the wheel. But, uh... So... Hold on. Let's see. I'm gonna go up. You can wall jump. Yeah, you go. So, yes, you can wall jump. And my skills are not are lacking at the moment. And we... So and then there's you know to get out there's a door up above and a key down below. So it's just like how do you how do you actually get to that point? And you wouldn't really know unless you try to. All right, this guy runs pretty fast. <laughs> I'm about to die. Okay. Yeah, I'm not the best wall jumper. I played Metroid Prime in my day, but I've been slacking. But yeah, we'll call, we'll call it there uh, before I embarrass myself too much more. Uh, yeah, and, uh, that was a really fun episode. Thank you for joining us, uh, Winston, Dark Swoop, and Tilpin. Yeah, hey, my wait, pleasure, man. Finished? Always a blast. Always a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's it then. All right. Yeah. Any closing thoughts, guys? Seems like uh, the Star Atlas and Alluvium debate will linger a, li a little bit longer on, on the YouTube, but uh, Maybe, I do yeah. believe that it was a positive spin for uh, the Star Atlas team. So uh, that was my hats off to Wagner to staying that confident and calm throughout the whole experience. And uh, I hope Kieran also learned something from that and uh, starts treating other projects and people with a little bit more respect there. So. Uh, yeah, so I'll just say thank you to everyone that's watched it live with us as well. I always find it amazing that you guys stick with it for this long. I've not got an attention span that long. I have to watch this show with breaks. So thank you so much to everyone that stuck with us and been talking at the same time. Amazing. Yep, Winston, any uh, parting words? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Uh, see you next time, uh, next episode. See what's up. <laughs> for sure. And, you know, to thank you so much for being here, for standing the test of time with us. We, we appreciate it all. Definitely like, subscribe. Uh, you know, I, I can't thank you guys enough for uh, all the support up until now. And uh, yeah, until next show. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. It was a pleasure. Bye, guys. Bye. Atlas Miner, you were born to push the block in search of all. Now it's time that you are gone, so farewell, Atlas Miner. And farewell, Mud and Pony, too. Who's the sector? Same to you. The pirate bastards ran him through. So farewell, Atlas Miner. They promised you. A diamond mine But I'll be damned It's hard to find I hope there's justice For their crimes And farewell Atlas Miner and farewell friend Don't take it hard Getting killed Ain't all that bad I'll treat you well In the repair yard So farewell Atlas